Okay. okay, so I think it's time. It's more important. So let's start our uh, afternoon. We'll have five talks all together, two and then three more. And the first speaker uh, now is Simon Trex from the University of Cologne, and he will talk about the rationalization in synthetic quantum matter. Please. Yeah. It's your time. Thanks, Natasha, for uh, giving you the start. Um, I actually adhere to uh, Andre's uh, task of giving, uh, you know, some general introduction and an overview. So I will talk about uh, what I think is an intersection of quantum magnetism and quantum computing. And uh, I will start with a letter and give you an idea uh, of what my perception is of where quantum computing is right now. Yeah. So we are in what's called the NISC era. Yeah. So the, the era of noise intermediate scale quantum devices, devices that have, you know, 50 to a thousand qubits. So what happened? Yeah. So, you know, some 10 years ago when I left Microsoft, it felt like, you know, we had charted out how it works. Yeah. We will, you know, have these quantum wires, we will have topological qubits, and we will build a topological quantum computer. Well, that didn't happen. And instead, you know, the field, you know, pivoted to, uh, to qubits that are not pristine, that are not topological, and that are noisy, you know? So this NISC is something that, you know, John Pascal uh, coined as sort of an also intermediate phase that should have ended already. But, you know, so uh, in the last five years, you know, we have seen, you know, these devices come uh, online, you know, of course, you know about the Sycamore chip at Google and then IBM has been, you know, charting out the roadmap where they really introduced uh, every year a bigger and uh, larger chip, you know, starting in 2019, you know, a chip is 27 transmon qubits you know, 65 in 2020, 127, you know, in 21. So you will be using- Wait, read this picture. The black dots are the qubits and the green dots are the gates. No, no, no. So in this picture, the black dots are qubits and the green dots are qubits. Yeah. Oh. So, uh, yeah. So, so here, you know, this, 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 these 27s are everything that's enclosed in this, you know, pinkish era. So it's a, it's a, what's the, they call it a heavy hexagon lens. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, we will use, you know, green versus black in just a second, but they're all cute. Yeah. Okay. So uh, in the this talk, are only along the lines. Yeah. So connectivity is, you know, two and a half, you know, so, you know, some qubits have two neighbors, some have three neighbors. So very low connectivity. Yeah. And I, I could give a talk about, you know, why, you know, this design is, is this way, but this is not what's going to happen. Yeah. So we will hear something about this chip, you know, in 2022, they introduced 433 qubits and last December, you know, the condo chip, which is this entire background, you know, of uh, a sound. So you really see that, you know, things have, have dramatically changed in the last five years in terms of availability of uh, devices with lots of qubits. And uh, this is, you know, what, what motivates me because, you know, once you think about, you know, computational physics, well, 27 qubits is, is small, but whoa, you know, 127 or a thousand qubits are way beyond, you know, what we could have ever thought about uh, doing ourselves. So the availability of, of devices, you know, with so many qubits, has of course triggered uh, all kinds of, of exploratory research. And interestingly, the first papers after the uh, quantum supremacy, the quantum advantage paper of Google in 2019, were papers, you know, by Frank Polman's group, you know, together with Google, uh, with Dekas, uh, uh, oh no, Yuna Kim's group, and here, you know, uh, Ashwin's group, you know, going basically back, you know, to topological states of matter on these devices, Sort of, you know, saying, well, this is just, you know, a stepping stone going into that direction. Yeah. So what I'll be presenting now in the following is, you know, how we might be using these devices just as they are, you know, uh, really large, uh, you know, many qubit systems. Yeah. And uh, so for me, the question is, you know, what is computational physics doing, you know, in the era of these these chips? Yeah. Uh, so here's my own. Yeah. So back in the day. Yeah. You know, 1953, we started classical many body physics, not we, because, you know, probably none of us was born at the time. Yeah. Uh, uh, but 1953 is the year that uh, in Los Alamos, Edward Teller, together with Metropolis and the Rosenbluts, you know, uh, developed Markov chain Monte Carlo and, and kicked off the field of classical many body physics. Yeah. In 1992, you know, we started doing quantum many body physics, you know, with Steve White inventing DMRG. Yeah. You know, you heard earlier today about variation, you know, Monte Carlo or quantum Monte Carlo with Wertland pictures, which actually came later, yeah, than this. In particular, you know, when we use uh, uh, non-local updates, you know, all of these things were invented in the mid-90s. 
you know? And now I feel we are in something that I coined quantum square many body, you know, because the distinction is that, you know, these quantum many body simulations ran on classical hardware, you know, fancy GPUs or, or big, you know, HPC centers. These calculations, you know, we are now running on these quantum computers that are available, you know, like the ones here in the IBM cloud. And the algorithms, you know, that we are using will be, you know, quantum circuit. Now, you know, going from these generations to generations of, of algorithms, there's always, you know, something that is a stepping stone, some technique, yeah? So between, you know, classical and quantum Monte Carlo, of course, pass integrates are the tool you know, that translate between one and the other, yeah? So a D plus one dimensional system you know, can be classically simulated. That's what quantum Monte Carlo really is, yeah? And the stepping stone between, you know, this and that, you know, between doing quantum many body on classical systems and quantum many body on quantum devices are tensor networks. Yeah, because they, they, you know, were born, you know, in the, in the language of DMRG and, and MIRA and these kind of tender network techniques. And they are also the language, you know, to discuss quantum circuits, you know. So quantum circuits that can be shallow, meaning they only have a few steps, or quantum circuits that are deep and uh, have as many uh, gates as we have, you know, qubits in the systems. These circuits will involve both unitary uh, gates as well as measurements, you know, and sometimes they will be measurement only. Okay, so I will talk about this uh, uh, in, in more detail in just a second, but let me actually try to emphasize also a paradigm change, you know, that is happening between the first two uh, uh, sets of doing calculations and the last one, the one that we are entering now. And that is, you know, in the, in the conventional way of thinking about uh, computational many body physics, we are uh, driven by Hamiltonian dynamics. You know, we start saying, this is a Hamiltonian that we are interested in, and we are looking for its ground state. Yeah? So let's try to find out what that is. Is that a superconducting state, uh, you know, or, or whatever. Yeah? Um, while here, yeah, we are throwing away the concept of a Hamiltonian. And what we really do is, you know, we do wave function dynamics, yeah? or circuit dynamics, but I don't want to call it circuit dynamics, but, you know, the, the central element will be a wave function. And there will not be a Hamiltonian. You know? Because you know we will take a wave function and just you know run it through the circuit, and that is not the same thing as you know looking at the uh, ground state as of a Hamiltonian. Yeah? So uh, uh, please keep this in mind, and I will come back to this point now continuously during the talk. You know that what sets you know this type of calculation apart that we run on these machines in these circuits are really just massaging wave functions, and uh, there is no Hamiltonian directly uh, that is you know describing what we are doing. D wave is doing D wave is different. Okay. D wave is different. So it's really about digital circuits now that we do, and and now I'm trying to motivate you know why you know this might be actually interesting, in uh, in looking at problems in quantum magnetism, but yeah. by trying to explain you know how we can get these phenomena of fractionization and emergent you know gauge fields you know uh, uh, things that we are very uh, much aware of in the context of spin liquids in such quantum. Good. So this is a quantum circuit in a nutshell. Yeah, so it has, you know, uh, all kinds of elements, you know, so quantum gates, you know, unitary gates, you know, Hadamard's that entangle, you know, uh, poly rotations, these kind of things, yeah. You know, there's measurements. Now you can take the outcome of a measurement and, you know, form something, you know, as a, as a consequence of that, you know? And, and what the circuit will do is, you know, you take an initial wave function, you know, you run it through the circuit and you end up with some other wave. And the idea is that the wave function in the end is a more interesting one than the one that you took in the beginning. So you put in a product state and you end up with an interesting entangled state. Now, for what follows, you know, the most important element in this circuit is going to be the measurement. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we will play a lot with measurement. And because measurements have random outcomes, you know, the effect will also be that there's not a single wave function coming out of here, but wave functions. You know, because there will be multiple measurement outcomes and that will give, you know, rise to an ensemble of outcome wave functions you know, that are here in the end. And this, these wave functions, their, their uh, properties is what uh, I'm gonna discuss and describe, okay? So let's talk about measurements, you know? Well, measurements are, are uh, you know, super important in quantum mechanics in the early days, you know, we know this, and they're a very traditional means of extracting information from a system. That's also true in quantum mechanics, of course, yeah? Special things, you know, Born's rule, uncertainty relations and all these things. But there's another thing in quantum mechanics that measurements can do is that they can actually shape entanglement. Yeah? 
So they can actually be a resource. They can be, you know, a tool to do things. Yeah, and that sets you know measurements apart uh, in quantum mechanics from you know the way that you use measurement in classical physics. Yeah, and this idea that you can just use measurements, you know, to do stuff. Yeah, will be now the the theme uh, of of you know what comes. So the first you know people to to look at this you know were people like Roman. You know, who looked at, you know, uh, quantum circuits that not only have unitary gates, but also have, you know, measurements in them. Yeah. So tons of measurements, not at the end of the circuit, but interleaved, you know, with the unitaries in the circuit. Yeah. And what this will give rise to is a transition in the entanglement structure of the states, you know, that you create, you know, through such circuits. Yeah. So giving rise to so called entanglement phase transition, uh, you know, for instance, in this case, between a volume law uh, entangled state. And an area law entanglement. So what does that mean? You know, it means that you know, for some, you know, probability of you know putting measurements into these circuits, there will be a range where the you know the ensemble of wave functions that come out of these circuits have volume law entanglement, whereas you know if there's more measurements, you know, they will have area law entanglement, and there's a sharp transition. Yeah. And the surprising thing actually here is you know that this volume law phase survives you know infinitesimal amount of measurements. Yeah, and it doesn't you know immediately break down into an area loss. Good. So probably Roman will talk more about you know these types of ideas. Yeah, uh, in his talk, um, I will now use measurements to you know directly induce entanglement. Yeah, in in a state. Okay. Good. So classic version is you have a wave function, you measure stuff, and then you know you get you know plus or minus outcome if you have a single qubit. Yeah. If you have two qubits, you can actually buy you know. Uh, measurement induce a bell pair so you can create an entanglement and in order to do this we will use a third cube okay so i have three qubits and i have a mini circuit here which you know has two unitaries that will entangle you know the two outer qubits with the guy in the middle the auxiliary qubit whose only purpose is to be measured and the effect of this guy being measured is that the two other guys become entangled so i create a bell pair by measurement yeah throwing away one auxiliary qubit okay Good. So that's nice. And this is, you know, sort of the idea that is underlying the idea of, you know, measurement uh, uh, induced uh, uh, quantum computation by, by Rausendorf and Brie. So what is the advantage? I mean, you couldn't have done this by unitary on the two qubits. I, well, no. So in this case, I could have done this. Okay. So now stay with me because now I will do it with many qubits. Yeah. So now I do this with n qubits and I, I will just repeat this circuit. Yeah. You know, now in this odd, uh, even staggering. Measuring and now I get a GHC state. So I get this macroscopic cat state, you know, all qubits up plus all qubits down, yeah, uh, for well, half of the qubits in this case. And the, the notable thing is I can create this state uh, very quickly, yeah, in a unitary circuit. Now I would have, you know, taken a lot of Haramas, you know, and it would have taken me n steps, you know, to create such a, you know, such a state. But here it takes me one, two, three, independent of how many qubits I have, you know. So if I, you know, take that thousand qubit processor of IBM, it also takes me just three steps. And now your question, you know, the blue and the green qubits, you know, you immediately realize, you know, that half of these qubits would be those measurement qubits uh, on that chip. Yeah. So we just assign them the role of you know, the qubits that we use to entangle and measure and then, you know, throw away, but we get some structure out of this. Yeah. Okay. So here you see the power of measurement. Yeah. So circuit depth goes down from, you know, extensive down to order one. Yeah. So we can very quickly uh, entangle states. Yeah. Of course, you know some of us knew this all along. Yeah. So Alex Ekitaev knew this in '97 when he wrote down the Toric code. The Toric code is really a measurement protocol. Yeah. It has two types of measurement: you know, a stabilizer of x's and a stabilizer of z's. And how does it work? Yeah. So you take a plucket, you have an auxiliary qubit in the middle. You know, you entangle that auxiliary qubit. You know, for harder, you know, these 40 knots, and then you measure it. Yeah, and thereby you have, you know, performed this stabilizer measurement here, or you know, this X stabilizer measurement here. Important words are measurement protocol. Yeah, we in the quantum many body community have often looked at the Toric code primarily as a Hamiltonian. Yeah, and talked about the ground set of the Hamiltonian. That's not, you know, what we're doing here. Yeah, here it's just a measurement protocol. There's two sets of measurements, two rounds, first Z, then X, then you're done. You know, and then you know this. This stabilizer code has created, you know, this interesting wave function that we can describe as loop gas, you know, has a logical qubit space and all of that in just two steps. Yeah. Okay. So the sign and 
the measurement determines the sign in front of the stabilizer. In, indeed, and and you know we might need to run a secondary you know step you know you know taking away certain you know uh, syndromes yeah but that's sort of a trivial step yeah uh, you know the, the the quantum error correction it you know you know the syndrome you know what to do yeah so it's a single step afterwards you know after measurement outcomes what to do to get the pristine wave function you have to highlight them there or something right or... yeah yeah okay still <laughs> still yeah so so it it, it doesn't cost anything. Yeah. Okay, but but the, the money change is from you know looking at the ground state of a Hamiltonian that stabilizes the state for me to I do a protocol of measurements and I get exactly the same. State. Okay. Good. Um, so now I want to play with this idea and construct a, a couple of interesting you know situations where measurements are are playing you know the crucial role of you know creating an entangled state of matter. So this is where the gun. Because it was my, you know, very very good postdoc Guiyi Zhu, uh, and there's two stories. You know, the first story is like the Toric code. It's a story about commuting measurements, yeah. And the second story is about measurements that do not commute, yeah. So the right one, you know, this x x y y z z, you know, looks a lot like Kitai Hamiltonians, Kitai spin liquids, but it's now a measurement protocol. While on the left, you know, this is just you know these these. You know, that will connect to something that we have called Nishimori's cat for reasons that I will show you in just a second. Okay, so what are we looking at? So, uh, uh, so the protocol is, you know, we have a honeycomb lattice of qubits, like the one that we have on the IBM devices, yeah? And uh, we will now use the auxiliary qubit in the middle, yeah? To do the following, so we entangle ZZ, ZZ, and we measure. So that, that gives me exactly, you know, this belt pair in the ZZ basis. Okay, so I create entanglement, you know, showing this easy measure. Okay, good. And I could do this now on all the bonds. But now I introduce an additional parameter, and that is I screw up, you know, the measurement, uh, the, well, the, the rotation of this easy gate. Yeah, so I put in here a parameter that, you know, goes between zero and pi over four, you know, doing a perfect rotation or not. And that parameter, yeah, will allow me as I tune it to go between strong measurement for pi over four projective measurement, yeah, to weak measurement if t is small, okay? So together with Skuyi, Nat, Ashwin, and Ruben, uh, so we looked at this problem. And the interesting thing is that as you go from strong projective measurement to weak measurement in this problem, there's a phase transition. There's a phase transition between a long range entangled state that you can create for projective measurement and the short range. Yeah, so if everything is uh, projective, you now you get this GHC state on you know, the honeycomb lens. GHC state was this all up, plus all down state, yeah, here on the right, yeah. Now, the interesting thing is that this problem, yeah, you know, we can simulate also on a classical computer, you know, we can run it through a hybrid, you know, tensor network Monte Carlo scheme, tensor network to contract the qubit degrees of freedom, Monte Carlo to, you know, you know trace out the, the measurement outcomes. And if you do so, you will realize that this problem is actually very simple, yeah, and has an analytical solution. Yeah, so you can actually map this problem to the random bond Ising model, yeah, you know, so the random bond Ising model has a phase diagram, temperature, and disorder, and there's an Nishimori line in that phase diagram that Nishimori found 40 years ago in his PhD thesis, where disorder and thermal fluctuations cancel out one another in a way that the free energy is frustration free, and you can write it down and calculate it exactly. So along this red line, yeah, the random bond Ising model is exactly so. Uh -huh. And that's great because you know there is a transition between the power magnet and this ferro magnet, you know, in that model, yeah? And in our language, yeah, uh, the, the temperature scales here, yeah, are associated in the following way. So weak measurement is up here at infinite temperature and projective measurement is down here at zero temperature, yeah? So as a function of measurement strengths, you know, we trace out this temperature line and we have to go through this phase transition, the Nishimori point, yeah? So that is our phase transition, yeah? Good, so that was a cool story. Yeah, and that you could show that even if you you know put an imperfection into the circuit, you know this notion of long range entanglement, you know is stable, uh, uh, you know to such a perturbation, similar to a notion you know that we have built up for Hamiltonian ground states. Now, so Shagan Wen you know has characterized you know really all kind of entanglement structures you know that you know Hamiltonian ground state can have. So in two dimensions, the gap in your Hamiltonian your ground state. Will be topological, so it's long range entanglement, and these kind of statements, yeah, they all include statements about stability. 
Yeah. So this is the stuff that we know about ground state from Hamiltonians. And you would like to know, you know, whether similar notions hold for wave functions created out of circuits. Yeah. Yeah. The fundamental difference, yeah, becomes also apparent here because you know, here I map my problem. Yeah. A two-dimensional quantum system to a two-dimensional classical system. So there is no plus one in the dimensionality. Yeah. There's no pass integral in an imaginary time you know, that goes to zero temperature. It is, you know, it's a circuit that is shallow, that has just three steps. Yeah. So imaginary time doesn't exist. Yeah. So that's why you end up with a classical system in the same dimension. Yeah. So, you know, from this perspective, you know, this Nishimori point is, you know, what we would call a conformal quantum critical. Yeah. It's a wave function deformation, you know, that we are performing. And, you know, we go critical at this point, only that this point is a very complicated point to describe in terms of, you know, these conformal fields. Let me ask you a question. So mm -hmm. your imperfection, it's kind of a combination of thermal fluctuation disorder or just disorder? Well, in, in, in our case, in this, yeah, yeah uh, what we do is, you know, we, we introduce a coherent error. Yeah. So that's what we do. Yeah. So we go from, from strong to weak measurement. Yeah. So it's, it's, so we, so we mix in, yeah. Uh, uh, this order, but in a way that it remains, you know, nicely uh, uh, balanced. Yeah. So we are we are fixed to the Nishimori line. That's actually very important. Yeah. So while the Nishimori line in the two D Eisen model, yeah, is something highly fine tuned. Yeah. So there's two parameters, you know, temperature and disorder, and you have to, you know, navigate them closely to to stay on the line. My quantum system has no choice; it has to sit on them. Yeah. So Bond's rule, you know, for measurement outcomes. You know, it tells me that I I can only sit there, nowhere else. Yeah, you know? so it's actually very important. So it's also a super stable phenomenon for me to go through the Nishimori transition. I cannot circumvent it; it has to sit along my line. Yeah. You know? Okay. So you know, theory paper was, you know, column two in my my statement. You know, calculations on a classical computer. Experiment is you know we put this on the IBM device, and we have seen that Nishimori transition on that device. Yeah. You know? So using these 127 qubits throwing away half of them, you know, as measurement qubits, yeah, in, in this scheme here, you know, we were able to create, you know, GHC states of 50 plus qubits and, you know, pull them through this, through this phase transition, yeah, which is, you know, which is, I think, you know, super interesting because, you know, we have no access to these type of transition in external. Good. So now comes story number two. This was sort of the warm up. yeah, we did uh, commuting measurements. So now let's do non-commuting measurements akin to the Kitarite model, which we know is an interesting model and gives, you know, interesting entanglement structures in Hamiltonian land. So now let's understand, you know, what it does when we bring it to, uh, to measurement land. Yeah, so we do a Kitarite circuit. Okay, so on the left is the Hamiltonian. Yeah, so I have a honeycomb lattice, you know, say it's spin one half. I have these exchange terms. Now I have an interesting ground state with some entanglement structure. And now I go to the right-hand side. So the spin becomes a qubit. And you know these exchange terms become pairwise parity checks in different, you know, poly bases, you know, x, y, z. So I do measurement, you know? and then I create a dynamical state. You know? So I do these measurements, you know, on some initial wave function, yeah. And then I ask, you know, what is the state that I get, you know, or the ensemble of states that I get after doing, you know, tons of these measurements, yeah. And you know the the key feature that combines the left and the right is again frustration. The the, the point that these measurements do not commute. That these operators in the Hamiltonian do not commute is what gives rise to interesting structure in the wave functions in the ground state or in this dynamical steady state. Okay, good. So okay, so they do not commute. Now let's let's see how we can go from you know our perception of what the Hamiltonian does, you know, to these measurement protocols. So the first thing we can do is we can write down you know what the Hamiltonian is. Well, in a tensor network description, yeah. So let's assume you know we have two types of terms in the Hamiltonian, not three like in the Kitab, just two, yeah? So I can do a totalization of, you know, these terms in the, in the Hamiltonian and I, you know, write them down and then I do an imaginary time evolution. And that is, you know, what, what you know, the, the language of tensor networks for Hamiltonian. Now let me translate that into measurement. Well, you know, that would be if I, if I post select, you know, measurements in a way that for every single measurement, I say exactly what the outcome should be, yeah? So for instance, if I have a projector, you know, some Heisenberg Hamiltonian into singlet channel, you know, I would say measure, and then if it's not the right channel, I throw away, you know, whatever has happened. Yeah. 
So I can I can rephrase what the Hamiltonian is as a post-selected you know measurement protocol. Okay, so I wouldn't do that. Yeah, but this is this is just for you to conceptually understand you know what we do. So now let's not post-select. So let's see measurement outcomes be whatever they want to be. Yeah. So then that is a measurement protocol which has a flocay structure because it has this odd even. Okay. So this is now interesting, and the disorder will be born disorder, yeah? So the measurement outcomes will be born probabilities, you know, that will say, you know, what comes out of these, these individual measurements. And then I can also drop, you know, this, this brick wall circuit and, you know, just randomly start, you know, picking, you know, measurements and also, you know, lose that, that temporal order. So I will start here on the right and then go to the middle. I think I asked this in the previous talk, but I forgot. Uh... The of yours, sorry. Um, it's a rotation or it's a measurement because what you were showing before was that it was a rotation, it's, it's a measurement, measurement. Yeah, so okay, so what I'm showing here is going to be a two qubit measurement, and the way that the two qubit measurement uh, is performed is by doing first a rotation, you know, an entangling, you know, between you know, first qubit and an auxiliary qubit, then between qubit number two and the auxiliary qubit, and then you measure the auxiliary qubit, and the end effect is that you have done a parity check on the initial two qubits. Yeah, so you do, you know, effectively you do a single qubit measurement on an auxiliary qubit. Yeah, but what it, you know, because you entangled it, you know, before, you know, with these other two guys, and the way that you entangle, you can now do in the X, Y, or Z rotations. This is how you get X, X, Y, Y, or Z, Z checks. And of course you could do also all kinds of other things. Yeah, but that's the idea. Yeah. I think it's something basic. I mean, how how does measuring the one qubit affect uh, affect the others? Mm. Okay, so that's of course because I have entangled them before. Yeah. Okay, so I have three qubits. Yeah. I first entangle the left to the guy in the middle. Yeah. So those two guys are entangled. Then I entangle the guy in the middle with the guy on the right. Yeah. And then I measure in the middle, and that has the effect that both qubits which were entangled with the guy in the middle will now become entangled. Yeah. This, this is the creation of the bell pair that I showed at the beginning. This is how quantum teleportation works. Exactly. So, the state on, uh, so, okay, so depending on what the measurement outcome is, you then do something else later. That's what the idea is. Um, okay, so I will keep track of the measurement outcomes. That's important. Yeah. But either way, yeah, you know, the effect will be that I've generated entanglement between the two. Yeah. Good. Okay. Okay, so I have these two structures now. Yeah. Uh, you know, Completely random or floquet. So let's start with completely random. So I have my qubits on the honeycomb lattice, and I have now uh, three types of parity checks, you know, XX, Y, Y, Z, Z, that I will randomly apply in, you know, uh, time. Yeah. And then I will put, because I can, you know, a six qubit interaction on top of this. Yeah. Which is an interaction term that is not the Plucket flux of the uh, uh, guitar IF model, but something non commuting. Yeah. That is a six spin interaction. And I also sample this. Great thing is, it's still a so-called Clifford circuit. It's all projective measurements, and I'd be very good and very efficient at sampling it. So here's a phase diagram. So what is this phase diagram about? This phase diagram is about entanglement structure. So it's an entanglement phase diagram. It says, so they say, you know, if I go to, for instance, this corner here, where x x checks are very likely, yeah, as opposed to here, where y y checks are very likely, yeah. So you know, it's a tetrahedron in these, you know, four probabilities. It says, you know, that a typical state, you yeah, know, will have an entanglement structure of the following sort. So let's start, you know, with the base plane, which is something that uh, Videka and uh, uh, Saga have looked at first. You know, that's the measurement only Kitai model. Yeah. Uh, you know, this base plane looks different from the conventional Kitai Hamiltonian base diagram, which, you know, is a triangle. Yeah. So this one has a circle. Yeah, uh, and you know, then there's an entire spherical thing in this in this you know three-dimensional phase diagram. So in this phase here in the middle, okay. So the guys here on the on the outside are toric code phases, so just like you know in the Hamiltonian. But the thing in the middle, you know, which is this Dirac cone spin liquid in the Hamiltonian language, becomes something that has Fermi surface type scaling, L log L entanglement scaling, uh, in in this in this monitored version. Okay, good. And then you know I have this additional. Three more minutes. Oh, what? <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, probably I will kill my second story. Uh, you know, I have uh, you know this this sphere, you know, which has quantum Lifshitz scaling, uh, and then in the middle, you know, I have a volume law entanglement scaling 
plus a sub-leading uh, logarithmic scaling. Okay, so the interesting thing is I've gone now, you know, in simulating these circuits to a place where we have never gone, you know, in Hamiltonian land. Yeah, so, you know, there's a free Majorana limit, yeah, where I can, you know, determine these phase diagrams. And then there is a, a regime where I have interacting uh, fermions, uh, which, you know, here on the upper right in the Hamiltonian uh, world have a sign problem. And there is would actually argue because, you know, if you have a Fermi surface, then you must have a sign problem. Yeah, so I cannot simulate this efficiently. Yeah, but down here, I can. So now let me uh, uh, try to understand how I can quickly tell you the second story. Uh, now I will go from this, you know, completely random story to a Floquet story. And then like in the Nishimori story, uh, you know, uh, uh, weaken the measurement. So introduce decoherence so that, you know, the state that I had before, you know, so the state that has log L scaling, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, random Majorana singlet uh, state to bring it into a coherent superposition, you know, to do something interesting. Okay, so for that, uh, we go through a dynamical protocol, uh, you know, that Hastings and Ha, you know, have, uh, you know, devised first as a version to generate uh, a dynamical logical qubit. So it's a, it's a, a model where, you know, in the, you know, the, the different terms of the guitar model are flokerized, yeah? So you do ZZ, AYY, XX measurement, and step 0, 1, 2, and so on. Yeah, and, you know, the effect is that in every step, you know, you, you uh, dynamically prepare a toric code. Yeah, good. So now we are taking this Tory code like state and we now weaken the measurement. So we introduce uh, um, uh, decoherence. Yeah, and the effect will be, you know, that you'll be able to break up, you know, these Majorana dimers, yeah, of, you know, the, the Tory code like state. Yeah. Okay, so let me, uh, you know, jump ahead uh, to, to a slide. Um, I can show you this. Um, probably the most interesting surface. So the first statement is, you know, if you weaken the measurement, yeah, there will be a threshold of that Floquet code, yeah, uh, where you know the flux purification. So the the H uh, uh, sector of that that model becomes uh, um, uh, disordered. Then you know I want to show you this plot, uh, which is the most important one. You know, as a function now of, you know, the measurement strength in that Floquet protocol, I get a two-peak structure in something that is akin to the specific heat, yeah? So I have a density matrix to that density matrix. I can construct a Hamiltonian. From that Hamiltonian, I get an energy. And from that energy, I get a fluctuation. So something very constructed, yeah, uh, that has a two-peak structure. And of course, that thing, you know, we know from Hamiltonian land very well, yeah? So the Kitaev model in, in, uh, in its Hamiltonian version it's no sign problem. And so Yuki Motoma, you know, 10 years ago was able to you know, run finite temperature calculations. And if you look at the guitar, well, you know, and it's specific heat, it has two peaks, yeah? So one peak at very low temperature uh, where, you know, the gauge sector orders, that's a flux purification. So this is this peak in my uh, Floquet protocol. And then there is a crossover, yeah? Where, you know, the spin fractionization actually happens, yeah? So in the guitar, when there's finite temperature, you know, we can actually trace out, we can see, you know, where the spins fall apart, you know, by a crossover in the specific heat, it happens at temperatures of order one, you know? So it's a, you know, different system sizes, don't do any finite size scaling. This is where this happens. And here, this is where this happens in my qubits, yeah, in my circuit, yeah? So there, the same thing happens. If I go to, to very weak measurements, then akin to the Nishimori story, very, you know, weak measurements, in, you know, are like high temperature, I can see the fractionization of qubit degrees of freedom into Majorana fermions. Okay, good. So uh, let me jump over the rest. Oh yeah, I will tell you what's in the middle. Uh, you know, between the two peaks, there's a Majorana spin liquid, uh, where instead, you know, uh, you now have you know this this uh, valence one superposition of these Majorana pairs, and the scaling uh, is L log L of the entanglement negativity in that region. Okay, I will stop. Okay, thank you. Oh, uh, can you see a bit more about what you do with the measurement outcome? It seems like in the latter part, you just threw it away. But in some cases, you do need to 
yeah no no so we do we, we do we do need it yeah and we do need it for exactly what you mentioned the Tory code now we need this as syndromes we need this to decode yeah so in the end of the day you know we need these measurement outcomes to you know create a a measurement uh, uh an observable yeah that is actually non-zero yeah so where the disorder average you know is, is non-trivial so for instance in the in the first case uh you're looking at an edwards anderson order parameter yeah and in order to do that we actually need these measurements so we do not show them away. If you were to show them away, this would be just dissipation. Yeah, and this is not what this. For well, the entanglement entropy, you don't need them. Uh, no. Yeah. But still, mm -hmm. well, I guess my question was what it is. I mean, mm -hmm. like in the second part of your story, it's still a property of the trajectories, right? So there is, in principle, if you wanted to measure this, you'd need to post select, right? Yeah. So I I don't have that post selection problem. Yeah. Because you know, I, I get an ensemble and I can make these ensemble average starts. Yeah. So also, you know, in the in the initial Moriket, so you could have said, oh, you know, uh, there's an exponential post selection problem. No, there's not. Yeah. You know? Because I can I can just take you know this set of trajectories that are you know. So we do ten thousand runs on the classical computer. They do ten thousand runs on the quantum device, and then we can compare. Yeah. But it involves a decoding step. Yeah. On the quantum. So, so for the Nishimori problem, I understand, but for the like my own story, well, for the like Kitaya story, like. I mean, it is a measurement in your space transition, right? And it has mm -hmm. the same issues as other measurement in your space transitions. Like, mm -hmm. you wanted to probe it. You and I, I, and I, mean, I understand you need some yeah. decoding for the So I, I want to probe it. So, uh, you know, the way that I will probe it is not by, by looking at the entanglement negativity because that's prohibitive, you know, for experiment. Even the specific heat is very constructed, but there's other things like, for instance, you know, in the Kitai model, we know that at this higher peak, you know, the ZZ correlations will, will grow. Yeah, and this is actually two way as well. So the ZZ expectation value, you know, shoots up at you know the fractionization. I'll probably ask a duty question. Well, uh, in the Shimori problem, if you take a regional problem and you approach critical point, paramagnet, paramagnet, there are divergence susceptibilities. Uh -huh. In okay. terms of measurement, how you can well, treat this? There, the point is there is no divergence. Yeah. So the Nishimori transition, you know, does not have a divergence in the specific key. Yeah, it's a very special transition. It's completely analytical. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so why is that? Yeah. Um, so, to my surprise, I have learned, you know, that the Nishimori transition is not fully understood. Yeah. So, well, okay. So, okay. So let's. So let's. Let, let, okay. So, so for me, you know, authority. Yeah. So you talk to feel that it's a uh, supersymmetry and all kinds of. Things. No, we know there's a supersymmetry <laughs> and there's probably a non-unitary CFT. Yeah, but but you know, there's no one who can tell me, you know, from those people that I sing are the experts. Yeah, you know what that CFT is. Okay, so, um, yeah, okay, so you know, oh, you know, it's not completely unexplored. It, it's very well explored. Yeah, but it's not like the Ising transition that we know everything. Yeah? So we do not know what the quantum field is. It's yet information that is not known from other sources by doing measurements. Well, I can motivate you to to look. Can look into this problem because now we have a device, you know, where we can run through this transition. Yeah, yeah. But you know, the data that comes out of that device, yeah, is not, you know, to the precision that you can get a critical exponent. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a legitimate question, but it seems that you are using sort of quantum computer to learn something about quantum computer. Uh, <laughs> no, so I'm I'm using a quantum computer to uh, explore a quantum many body system. Yeah, so and my question, so. It, does it help us all that to understand something which we used to call physics? <laughs> you know, you know, this is super cool, yeah. You know, I I, I, I give you an RVB spin liquid, yeah, and I can create it now at my disposal. I have a turning knob, you know, that will scan me through this. Yeah, this is different from material science. This is also what motivates me, you know, to look at this two peak specific heat structure, you know? So if you talk about guitar materials, you have no chance to see those two peaks in any material ever, because one of these two peaks is hidden at 10 to the minus two, yeah, in temperature carriers, yeah? So where all kinds of other residual interaction will hide it, yeah? But here we have a pristine system, you know, where we can actually look at this system. You know, I understand you can invent many cute, cute models, but can you say something about old models? Oh, it, is it uh -huh. feasible at least? Yeah. So, uh, so that's you know that was the theme of the talk. You know, so instead of looking at the old Hamiltonians, I look at the measurement and you know variance. Yeah, and I see that some of the physics, like the fractionization story, carries over, and that is super interesting. 
but not everything you know that I learn on the other side, you know, these measurement protocols, you know, translates back to the Hamiltonian land. Now we see this because you know phase diagrams have different shapes in these types of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you know, what is actually that interests us? Yeah. So if you know I want to create a wave function that is you know very highly entangled, I now have a protocol to do that. Yeah. And I think that that in itself is very interesting. Thanks. Sorry. Yeah, I have a related question. I mean, it seems like you're conquering the sign problem, so there must be a catch because in the end you're running everything on a classical computer. Mm -hmm. So you take some model that has a sign problem, the Hamiltonian dynamics, you convert to a crippled circuit, which is then efficiently symmetrical on a classical computer. So Very what nice. if what yeah. what's okay. the catch? Okay, so there, there's two things. So in the in the first case where I said, you know, so here is a Clifford simulation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, there is no one-to-one -one correspondence to, you know, the Hamiltonian column, yeah? yeah? So I, you know, and this is now the interesting conceptual question, you know, what is it I actually learned? So if I learn that I, you know, in the interacting case, you know, get this, you know, Fermi surface-like structure, you know, is this revealing to me, you know, that the Hamiltonian would also have something like that? And I actually don't know the answer to that, yeah? So that, that's, a, that's a puzzle, okay? You know, for some things it works, you know, for the Tory code phase, it works beautifully, you know? So we never cared, you know, whether we look at the Hamiltonian of the Tory code or the measurement protocol of the Tory code because they give the same state, yeah? But that was also the most trivial scenario ever of commuting operators in the gap phase, yeah? Now for these gapless ones, it's more complicated. Now for the second story, we did run it, yeah? Using tender next on Monte Carlo and we can do 127 qubit devices, but then we're dead. Yeah, I cannot go up to a thousand. Yeah, so right now we are on the verge where I can do on a national high performance supercomputer the same thing that the IBM guys can do. Yeah, yeah, but you know, in two years down the road, I will not be able to simulate what they can do. Yeah. Sorry, even with Clifford circuits, I thought that. No, no, no. So the second story wasn't about Clifford. You know, whenever, whenever I have weak measurements, I'm in non Clifford land. When I have what, sorry? When, when I have, you know, when I, when I have weak measurements, you know, when I go away from this pyramid of rotation, oh, it's non Clifford anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. okay. Yeah? Okay, I think it's a good topic for <laughs> continuous discussion and we need to go over. Thanks a lot for a very interesting question. <laughs>
for the broad community of experimentalists and, and theorists. So we have neutron scatterers also working on this. And then the theory group where, you know, we develop the methodologies that, you know, as I said, I'm going to describe before, uh, you know, in a moment. And then uh, there is this other group of people with whom, you know, we work on the large and approaches that basically I will describe you in the second part of the talk. And that they are, as you will see, the large and counterpart of the semi-classical methods, the classical and semi-classical methods that I will describe in the first part of the talk. Actually, Shan Shung is here, sitting in the audience somewhere. <laughs> so, and he has been the main drivers, driver, basically, of the large and approaches that I will describe in the second part of the talk. But, you know, the main motivation is really to develop methodologies that can be used to reproduce experiments, as, as you will see, you know, these large and approaches not only are useful to classify spin liquid phases, but can also be very useful and quantitatively very good and sometimes better than the semi-classical approaches to describe experiments. So I will start you know, with uh, reviewing and revisiting some uh, classical limits of quantum spin systems, basically uh, generalization of the lambda Lipschitz dynamics. We'll see what, that's, what that means. Uh, we'll see that that leads to a generalization of the one over S expansion, the well-known one over S expansion. And then I will describe the large end counterpart of that. And you will see that you know, there is a nice mathematical correspondence. In one case, we are sending irreps of a Lie group to infinity in some sense. And in the other case, we are keeping the rep fixed and sending the group to infinity. So I will try to be uh, clearer about that, but let's start you know, with the classical and semi-classical approaches where essentially what we do is we send the index of irreps to infinity. So, uh, this is all probably well known for, for this audience. So we start with an SU2 algebra of spins. Uh, they close uh, this algebra with Levi-Civita tensor as the structure constant of the algebra. And then the, the immediate observation is that if we look at the left-hand side, it's quadratic in S, right? So if we now allow to change the reducible representations, the spin, on the left-hand side, we have something that is quadratic in S. On the right-hand side, we have something that is linear in S. So if we send S to infinity, Essentially, my operators commute, and I can replace them with uh, numbers, right? With the expectation values on on some particular basis that turns out to be the basis of coherent states, right? That we I, I can generate by applying an S2 rotation to a reference state that is a state polarized along the z-axis, right? And then all I need to do is I can replace simply the operators, the spin operators, with expectation values. And I will get a classical vector with fixed norm, right? That defines the phase space of my classical theory as a sphere, right? Um, which is equivalent to or isomorphic to CP1, right? The, the, the space of one dimensional subspaces in C2, right? My space of quantum mechanical states in a two, in a two level system. Good. So that is my phase space. I can extend the problem to the lattice by essentially considering the direct sum of the Lie algebras so that the coherent states are simply direct products of coherent states on each side. And then, you know, I can take the expectation value of Heisenberg's equation of motion and get my classical equation of motion that is nothing else than the lambda Lipschitz equation, right? Where the derivative of my classical vector as a function of T is the cross product of the vector times the effective magnetic field that I take by I, I obtain by taking the gradient of the, of the classical Hamiltonian, right? That is, is the expectation value of the operator as a function of, of, of the vector. And this cross product here comes from this Levichivita that remember was the structure constant of the situation. Good. Uh, the rest is also very well known here. You have two choices. I mean, like, you know, you can take the classical limits and S to infinity. So you're working in another Hilbert space, essentially when you do that. Uh, then you can do small oscillations, right? If the system is translational invariant, the normal modes are spin waves. And essentially what that means is you're replacing now the sphere by the tension space. You have a two-dimensional tension space, so one coordinate, one momentum. You can quantize them, and you are going to get you know, your uh, spin wave theory, to which you can also arrive by basically introducing Schwinger bosons to represent the spin operators, and then using the holstein primakov transformation to replace bosons on a given side by their expectation value, essentially, right? And you get a one over X, 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 X expansion, right? Which is different from the classical limit because here we are keeping the representation fixed and we expand in this parameter one over S. Now it turns out that there are situations 
like this one, this trivial situation where you have a single ion isotropy, for instance, uh, that is EC plane. And the ground state is uh, this SZ equals zero state, for instance. And clearly in this case, uh, if you take the expectation value of the spin operator is zero, right? Meaning that, you know, this is not a coherent state of SC2, but the theory can still be semi-classical or classical. What I mean is you can have a system which is well described by a semi-classical theory. Of course, you cannot use the, 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 the coherent states of SU2 that I just described to derive that classical thing. So what you have to do in that case is recognize that you know, the emotional state, quantum mechanical state, you know, three-dimensional state, will be a linear combination of this kind. I can parameterize it with four real parameters because you know, there is an, uh, a normalization on a phase right, that I can remove. And, and this state right, is simply a coherent state, but of SU3 instead of SU2. Right? These unitary transformations are unitary, so with a determinant equal to one, right, that act on this three-dimensional space. And now, uh, of course, uh, there is a subgroup of these unitaries that will leave the state invariant up to a phase. That's so, the so-called isotropic group in the case, this case is U2. So the, the space of coherent states is CP2 in this case, which is essentially SU3 divided by U2, right? And now we can, once again, follow the same procedure, right? To derive uh, an alternative classical limit of this ping one system. But the difference is because I'm using SU3, right? Uh, I now need to use not only the three uh, uh, components, SX, SY, and Z, but also the other five generators of SU3 that are the ones that you construct with the trace symmetric tensor in the spin operators. And of course, you know, this SZ equals zero state is an example of a state that has zero dipole moment and finite quadrupolar moment. Once again, you can uh, observe, I mean, now for SU3, the reps are labeled by two indices, lambda one and lambda two. I'm, I'm not going to explain, I mean, if you want after the talk, I can explain how these are obtained. But the important thing is that the fundamental representation, the three-dimensional one, corresponds to lambda two equals zero and lambda one equals to one. So I can define a classical limit now by sending lambda one, I keep lambda two to zero, and I send lambda one to infinity. And again, what I have on the left-hand side is quadratic in lambda one, the right-hand side is linear in lambda one, right? So once again, I can define a classical limit by taking the limit when lambda one goes to infinity. But in this case, uh, the one-to-one -one correspondence between coherent states and observables is between a coherent state and the expectation value, not only of these three dipole components, but also of these five quadrupolar components, meaning that the classical vector that I construct now has eight components and four constraints, right? Because remember, my phase space is still four-dimensional. And when we take the expectation value of Heisenberg's equation of motion, what we get is a generalized lambda Lucius equation, but the difference now is that this cross product not, does not correspond to the contraction with levi chivita tensor, but the contraction with the structure constants of the SU3 algebra, right? And of course, it's straightforward how to generalize this to SU. And this a classical equation of motion gives, you know, the, describes the evolution not just of the dipole moment, but also of the quadrupole, of, of the quadrupole moment. Correct. Uh, you can add noise and dissipation. You know, in the same way you can generalize lambda Lipschitz equation of motion, you can generalize Langevin dynamics. And in that, that way, you can put temperature in this classical calculation, and you can do linear and nonlinear dynamics. If you linearize, as I did before, around the ground state, now you have a four dimensional space. The tension space is four dimensional. I don't know how to plot a four dimensional tension space, but anyway. Uh, you know, you have a pair of coordinates and momenta, right, two pairs, sorry. That means that now we have two normal modes per spin. One are the usual spin waves, fluctuations of the dipole moment. The other one is fluctuations of the quadrupole moment, right? And of course, I can do the same that I did before. I can uh, start with some uh, representation, faithful representation of my generators of SU3 in terms of SU3, Schwinger bosons, apply holsten primakov essentially, and get a one over lambda one expansion now, right? Lambda one is the number of bosons, right? So that by fixing the number of bosons, we can move across different reps. And then, you know, this one over S, uh, lambda one expansion is essentially a loop expansion. So in all the cases, what you are getting is a loop expansion. You just count the number of loops and you have the order 
in one over lambda one, right? Um, so uh, now, uh, of course, this is if you linearize, right? So you do small oscillations or, uh, or and then, then, you know, you do some you know, linear corrections, uh, but sometimes you also want to study the full temperature dependence where, you know, you have interesting nonlinear effects. Uh, moreover, you can have topological solitons, you know, where, as I will describe in a moment, where, you know, you need to explore the nonlinear part of the equation. But let's stick with this material, right? This very simple material, I think, uh, uh, like a single ion anisotropy and several competing exchange interactions is not very important. Uh, the story is that if you take this material and, you know, that's what the experimentalists did the first time, they measure, right? They measure these two types of modes, then they try to fit them with linear spin wave theory, it didn't work. But then if you apply this SU3 linear spin wave theory, or, you know, if you want to call it multi-flavor or two-flavor linear spin wave theory, you can explain the modes. And what is really happening here is that, you know, you have a dispersive, uh, you know, spin waves or magnons that, you know, hybridize with a quasi-flat quadrupolar mode, right? And similar to the heavy fermions, there is a gap opening in the middle, right? And that's the way, you know, you get, you understand this data. Now that for the linear dynamics that, you know, is relevant at low temperatures, but if you want to understand the full temperature evolution, right, of the data, uh, then, you know, you can go back to this lambda Lucius dynamics, you know, with SU3 coherent stage. And actually you can give a very good description right, quantitative description of the full temperature dependence. And of course, you know, the, the, the dynamics becomes nonlinear in this region. So it's not enough to simply do the RPA or the linear spin wave theory. Good, so the other reason why you may be interested in nonlinear dynamics is fermions, right? So we know that in 2D, right, we can, if we consider 2D magnets, we can compactify the plane. If we consider solutions that are constant at infinity, and now, uh, you know, the target, the, the base space becomes the sphere, right? Once we compactify the plane and the target space, you know, for this usual classical limit based on coherent states of AC2 is also the sphere, as I just explained. So basically we can classify uh, these mappings according to the second homotopy group, right? Of the sphere, so that is the integers. And essentially, you know, we get uh, these Kirmian textures where uh, essentially what one is counting here, the degree of this mapping is, is simply the number of times this mapping is wrapped in the sphere, right? These are the usual skirmions at the, for instance, South Pole, the spin is pointing down, the dipole. Uh, when you go to infinity, the spin is pointing up. When you map this back into the sphere, uh, the infinity corresponds to, to the North Pole, right? And the spin is pointing up at the North Pole. Now, the first observation you can make is that the second homotopy group of CPN minus one is also the integers, right? So uh, you can embed essentially a sphere into CPN minus one. And, you know, you also have, uh, you know, you can also find skirmions in quantum paramagnets. Uh, the difference is that now, let's say you can have a dipole at the North Pole and a quadrupole at the South Pole, or you could have an octopole if you are working with SU4 or you know, things like that. So, uh, and essentially you can find solutions like this one, you know, as metastable solutions, but you can also find crystals of these CP2 skirmions using a very simple model. This is a spin one model with exchange and single ion isotropy in a magnetic field, right? So you can get skirmions that combine quadrupole and dipole, right? That is allowed by, uh, you know, this, uh, this in this new classical theory. So the picture is a result of what? Sorry? The picture is a what kind of computation? Uh, the, the, these are basically variational, so basically minimization of the classical energy, right? Using, you know, steepest gradient. Uh, oh, I see. Just like, uh, purely classical. See, yes, you know, topological solitons, you know, we know how to define, you know, classically, right? So okay. you work with a pure classical model, you find the ground state of this model, right, some region of E and H, right, and uh, you find these, these skirmions, right, that are CP2 skirmions. And moreover, you can study the dynamics, right, so you can, uh, you know, put temperature, as I said, and then uh, see how they, you know, this, this crystal evaporates, and you can see, you know, these skirmions and anti-skirmions, you know, floating around even, you know, in the high temperature. Classical dynamics. This is all classical dynamics. I mean, all this Kirmian physics is done with, you know, classical. That's the reason why I'm mentioning this here because I was describing the classical. 
then you can do, you know, normally they put quantum corrections perturbatively, but you know, there is no such a thing of, you know, this studies of this Kirmion's or Kirmion motion, you know, deeply, deep in the quantum mechanical regime, right? Okay, enough with the large, with the classical or semi-classical methods. Now, why we may want to now- Has that been seen in experiment, that particular thing? That no, we no, we, we propose it, but, you know, I think it should be quite, quite general because- so what material are you proposing? So, you know, there are some nickel base, you know, nickelates, right? You know, with that, you know, have this strong anisotropy, the nickel dichal cautionates, you know, and, you know, as you can see the model, you know, it's not that exotic, right? So anyway, so, uh, and actually the story is more interesting. I don't want to go too long with this, but, you know, you can define classical theories based on other irreps that are non degenerate irreps, you will get, you know, flag manifolds and you can get more exotic, you know, topological defects. So the, 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 the bottom line of this first part of the talk is that there is more than one way of taking a classical limit. And depending on the Hamiltonian, you have to choose one or the other one that, you know, will do better. Yeah. So, so the spins here are not really just dipoles, as you said, they, they could be also quarterpoles. That's, right, that's they are spin ones. So the, the classical degree of freedom can be, you know, has eight components, five that are like polar and- So, so this is pattern of vectoring is not just dipoles, it's not just demonizations. Sorry? So, so this pattern of arrows that, you, that you're showing here? Yeah, the arrows, you know, the length of the arrow denotes the dipole moment. And, you know, so here you see it's disappearing because it's becoming purely quadrupolar at, at infinity. Yeah. Very good. So anyway, so now why we may want to do something different well, uh, the reason is that, as everyone knows in this audience, uh, you may have situations like, you know, the, 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 the triangular lattice is probably the paradigmatic example proposed by Anderson, where, you know, he imagined that, you know, just the nearest neighbor antiferromagnetic interaction will lead to a spin liquid. It turns out that it doesn't. It orders in 120 degree ordering. But if you add a second neighbor competing interaction, it takes only, you know, 6% of a J2 interaction to induce apparently a second order phase transition into a quantum spin liquid say, uh, phase. I say apparently because this is a result of a DMRG calculation. Some people still don't believe that this is a quantum spin liquid, but you know, there is, I would say, you know, good amount of numerical evidence that you, you have a continuous transition into a quantum spin liquid. And of course, you know, when you have a situation like this one, you have to abandon your semi-classical methods because that means that magnons are slowly getting deconfined into spinons, right? You know, it's better probably to describe the magnons on this side as a two spinon bound state, right? So maybe start on this side from a non-interacting gas of spinons, and then you know, um, you know, get the magnons as as two spinon bound states, and that's something that one can do, right? Uh, using, for instance, a large n approach, right? That is what I'm going to describe in the in the second part of of the talk. Right, so, um, you know, one possible approach is, is to use, once again, the Schwinger bosons that I was using uh, to connect, you know, basically uh, the, 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 the small oscillations that you get, you know, classically with, you know, the, the ones that you get by, uh, you know, applying holsten primakov approximation. And, uh, but in this case, the difference will be that, you know, my Heisenberg model will be written in terms of bond operators, right? As a bilinear in these two bond operators, so the Heisenberg interaction is isotropic. The bond operators are singlets. And in this case, instead of replacing, to get a quadratic theory, instead of replacing a boson on a given side by the expectation value, that means we are breaking the symmetry explicitly, we are going to basically replace these operators by their expectation value. But because they are singlets, you are not breaking the symmetry. And consequently, magnetic ordering will be obtained as a spontaneous Bose-Einstein condensation by quadratic theory. The way one can uh, describe, you know, do this, you know, that I just described in words is by going to a path integral formulation, once again, in this case, using coherent states of SE2, and then uh, introducing, you know, a Lagrange multiplier to enforce the constraint, and then, you know, external sources to compute uh, correlation functions. And also, because I told you that, you know, the Magnetic ordering is obtained as spontaneous symmetry breaking. We need to apply a, an infinitesimal stagger field in order to choose the state with long range order in order to do the dynamics on top of it. The way you do it is you just apply a uh, Howard Stratonovich transformation, basically, or you know, this Hamiltonian with this bond operator. So now 
uh, my fields will be these W fields associated with these, um, you know, uh, two bond operators A and B, and uh, you know we can now in principle integrate out uh, the bosons, right, the Schinger bosons, and get a theory in terms of these auxiliary fields, and then you know we can do the usual saddle point expansion, right, the Gaussian fluctuations, and uh, you know all that can be done basically in a diagrammatic way where we have to introduce a propagator for the spinons, right, for the bosons, and then a propagator for these auxiliary fields, the RPA propagator. And something important to keep in mind is because we are in an ordered phase, uh, there is a condensate component of contribution to the Green's function of, of, of our bosons, and that turns out to be important because uh, of a reason that I will mention in the next slide. So if you compute the dynamic susceptibility at the saddle point level, so basically you create a spin excitation, it decays into two spinons, right? And because we have a condensate, we are going to get poles, but you know, as you can see, these are going to be single spin on poles. One spin on condensed, the other one, you know, will give me the dispersion of the single spin on, which you know, at first sight is not correct. Actually, it is not correct. Because in the magnetically ordered phase, the true collective modes are not single spinons, are magnons, right? So there is no way of getting the right dispersion at the saddle point level when we use a large N approach if we are working on the magnetically ordered side. And indeed, the theory tells us, you know, how to fix this. Because if you go now to the next or, uh, or the, the next order diagrams in one over N, and here I put it between quotes because in the presence of a condensate. Although, I mean, in absence of a condensate, this will be the next, the, the diagrams that are of order one over n. One has to count basically the number of RPA propagators that gives you one over n, an order one over n, and then the internal loops give you an order n, right? So basically these are all the diagrams that you get at order one over n. But it turns out that in the presence of a condensate, this diagram has a singular contribution that is of order one and cancels exactly the residues of the single spin on poles of this diagram. So when you add the two together, so this one acts as a counter diagram for the single spin on poles of, of, of the saddle point diagram. Now uh, you get, uh, you know, only the poles of this RPA propagator that are the true collective mode. So you get, you know, magnons as, as two spin on bound states. And indeed, when you compare against, you know, this is a material that is a good realization of a 2D Heisenberg model with EC plane and isotropy. Uh, this is the data. This is what you get at the saddle point levels. So you get a lot of spurious modes, but once you add this counter diagram, you get a very good agreement with, with the data. And you know, this is a situation where if you try to do the loop expansion that I was describing in the first part of the talk, uh, you don't capture you know, not even a tenth of, of the continuum that is here. And also you cannot explain the dispersion, the single magnum dispersion quantitative. What is the size of the moments? The size of the moment uh, here in, is, is roughly 40% of the full moment. And that's kind of a tuning parameter in your calculation or? No, that you, you get it right. So, so the size of the moment agrees very well, you know, with the numerical calculations, the MRG and, and QMC is 0.2. From the Schwinger boson calculation. From the Schwinger boson calculation, yes. Yeah, with, with uh, spin waves with one loop correction is 0 0.25, with Schwinger boson is 0 0.2. You probably said this. If you start just for simple spin wave, half that prima couple step, and yeah. do large chain expansion order by order, then what? This expansion doesn't converge. If you do, sorry, large n expansion. No, no, no. large ah. s. Large s. No, I mean I, all I can tell you is if you do one loop correction, you know the error is is factor factor of two more or less in the bandwidth of yeah. the magnet dispersion, and then you know the weight. You know I have a slide later, but you know you underestimate the weight in the continuum. You see there is this structure in the continuum and actually the, the weight in the continuum is roughly three times the weight in the single magnum peaks. So that you, you, you get it the other way around if you do you know, one loop correction. And I think it makes sense because you are close to this point. So eventually close enough to that point, you know, the, the, the one over S expansion has to fail. Okay, uh, the other interesting example you know, of uh, QCP where as I will argue in a moment, the, the large end approach does much better than the semi-classical, is this very simple example, square lattice by layer. You have intra-dimer interaction J, inter-dimer interaction J prime. And there, you know, if you compute the critical value of J prime over J 
for the transition from the quantum paramagnet, where you, roughly you have a singlet in every single vertical bond, to the antiferromagnet. If you, if you do the semi-classical theory that I described in the first part of the talk with SU4 string wave theory and blah, 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 you get 0 0.25 for the critical uh, G. If you do SU2 Schwinger bosons, you get 0 0.235. But the, the quantum Monte Carlo result, you know, this one doesn't have a sign problem, is 0 0.4. And actually, if you do, if you now introduce SU4 Junger bosons and you do large N, as I will describe in the last two slides, you get 0 0.20, 0 0.42. And the way you do it is you introduce these three bosons, which are essentially the bosons that uh, Subir and Bat introduced a long time ago, where you have you know one boson that creates the singlet and three that create the triplet. But the difference is now we introduce these bond operators that are singlets, SU2 invariant, not SU4. Uh, so singlets for the symmetry group of the Hamiltonian. Again, you start from this Hamiltonian, you do a one over an expansion, you add the counter diagram, the fluctuations, and this is the comparison between quantum Monte Carlo and the calculation on the paramagnetic side. This is on the ordered side, the transverse modes, and this is the, the longitudinal mode, you know, that actually has a power law decay. I mean, this one is damped, right? <laughs> While, while these ones remain uh, sharp, right, as expected. So uh, quantitatively, you know, this reproduces, you know, very well, you know, this quantitatively. Something important to mention is that if, if I try to do a semi-classical approach here for this value, you know, the semi-classical approach will tell me that I am here, right? So I told you 0 0.25 is the critical G. So both uh, the, 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 the usual, the standard SU2 Schunger boson theory and the semi-classical one uh, will put this point on the ordered side, right? So they will disagree heavily with this uh, discussion. So in summary, uh, you know, the classical and the semi-classical approaches are based on uh, as you, as you end states, you know, can you have a lot of systems actually where entanglement is not too strong. Uh, it's, it's important to extend the classical approaches beyond, you know, the usual and the dynamics to describe many magnets, you know, where again uh, you 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 need to introduce coherent states that are not coherent states of SU two, and actually near let's say quantum melting points near points where the magnetic ordering is suppressed, it turns out that the one over n approach, right, where we again uh, fix the rep and send n to infinity, uh, you know, is working quantitatively qu very well. So that's the reason why I'm saying, you know, it's not only useful, these approaches are not only useful for classifying spin liquids, but also to reproduce experimental data. And, and the, 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 the key is that you need to go beyond the saddle point to remove the single spin on poles. The true collective modes are magnons that appear as poles of the RPA propagator. So you need to go necessarily beyond saddle point. Uh, you get correct order moments and magnum velocities. I didn't discuss that. Uh, you also get the structure of the continuum, right, for this material that is near this uh, quantum melting point on the triangular lattices. And moreover, for this other material, right, ah, something I didn't mention is that if you take the largest limit, right, once you added these fluctuations, you recover linear spring wave theory. That's something that, you know, was not possible to do with, with several point people were trying to do for years and they couldn't recover the, the correct uh, linear spring wave theory in the largest limit. You know, that's the reason, the reason is you need to go beyond several point. And finally, you get the quantitatively correct dynamics for the QCP of this high layer anti So thank you for your attention. No questions. Uh, at some point, you showed the strangler antiferromagnet with second neighbor exchange, yeah. where there is supposedly large range of intermediate spin liquid phase. Yes. Uh, question Is there any understanding why the range A is so large and B, uh, this is spin one half, right? Yes. Is there anything known about spin one? Uh, no, that I know, at least, you know, you mean if there is a spin liquid phase for spin one okay. in this region? I think that's the first part of the question. Is okay. it known analytically that it should be that large? Uh, no, <laughs> I don't know that I, I know of, you know, you can do, you can start from the semi-classical approach, you know, coming from yeah, both sides. One eight. A first transition, right. 
but uh, no, I, at least I don't know. I mean, and I don't know if there is a study for spin one, right? You know, trying to find this this space in between. But okay. if you, you use your approach, if for example, if you start with one eight and assume long range order, do you see that fluctuations are destroying this order? You mean if I I we shouldn't have not exactly one, we, we cannot get this phase, mm -hmm. right? So we are working here, right? Uh, you know, to get this phase with Schwinger bosons, you need to artificially reduce, you know, the the spin somehow, right? You know, that, that number that you put the constraint. So, but you don't get this phase. So, you know, it's only obtained numerically. So the only thing we are doing is we are approaching the problem from this side using a large chain approach, and you know, we get the the order the southern point. Yeah. So I also so the, what is the experimental situation in the QSL regime? Are there ah. are there various claims of triangle lattice spin liquids. That, that's right. You know, they are studying the the these series of materials, right? You know, these yeah. the materials, and uh, there is one based on sodium that supposedly is here, but you know, there is also a large amount of disorder. So nobody is. I mean, it's not very clear, right? So if it doesn't order because it is a spin liquid or or because of disorder. But yes, there is an, effort, an experimental effort to move in this direction, right? Uh, try to, to get into this space. Unfortunately, the only material that I know that could be in this space has sodium, and you know, the disorder can be important. There's some people that claim spin on foamy surfaces. Yeah, exactly, like, exactly. They see a lot of gapless excitations. I'm not in that space. But that was the sodium material. Yeah, that was the sodium material, yeah. yeah. If I remember correctly, this uh, quantum spin liquid is being argued to be Dirac spin liquid. Well, there is an ongoing debate also whether it is a Dirac spin liquid or if it is a Z2 spin liquid. And, you know, it's these usual games of, you know, I mean, trying to detect, you know, a gap, dis distinguish a gapless from a gap phase, you know, with EMRG. And, you know, so I don't see any conclusive evidence yet, you know, for the moment, you know, the nature of this thing. I mean, in the approach that I'm using, I'm assuming that this is a C2 spin liquid, as you can imagine. I mean, yes, but maybe with fermions that you would be able to capture, even if it's a, a Dirac spin. Yes, liquid, exactly. Right? But so, then, you know, what, you know, that's what I asked my colleagues. Why not doing the same calculation with fermions here and try to de de describe, you know, the dynamical spin structure factor of materials that are known with fermions? Right. So, is there any understanding, like, for example, these issues of these cancellations that you get? With one over n to describe the, the ordered state with fermions can can can. Well, fermions, it will be a different story because I think you will have to break the symmetry explicitly, right? You have to do a usual mean field approach. That's one of the issues. But yeah, I think it's an excellent point. I mean, like you know, if if one believes that you know fermionic theory will do better, you know, maybe the right thing to do is to start you know with the materials that are known and try to reproduce this of you know omega with fermions. There is a paper I think by Yuan Ming Lu and. Uh, Pao Wang, where they give you a recipe for which particular boson theory is equivalent to which particular mm -hmm. fermion theory. So you can, there's a mapping between the sugar bosons and the sugar fermions. Right. Pro is very non local, I guess. Uh, of course, yeah. yeah. But yeah. <laughs> it's not the case that fermions would be able to capture more phases than bosons in general? Yes, it is. Well, they don't work as well near a magnetically ordered state. So at some point you show this uh, calculation um, where you say uh, the, the spin waves are mixing with uh, quadruple um, excitations and then there is an experimental comparison. Ah, yeah. Is there an experimental technique that can allow you to see the, the quadruple component of that excitation? Yes, with Riggs. Riggs. Yeah. But, uh, so the, the only challenge in that case is... Uh, but here the... you can also see them with neutrons. That's the beauty of this, because, you know, SV is not a conserved quantity. The Hamiltonian is mixing states with different Z. So you can see indirectly the, you know, the, you, you, you know, the only reason why you can, you can see this beautifully is precisely because you have a term that is mixing quadrupolar and, and dipolar modes, mm -hmm. right? So that rule of neutron scattering delta Z equals to plus minus one or zero, is only valid if you have U1 symmetry, but here you don't, right? So you can, with neutron scattering, you have access both to states, you know, with quadrupolar and dipolar character because they are mixed. And, but if they were not- answer, yeah. Just now, basically you are saying that using rigs to, to observe the same Brillouin zone region, you will see it's different intensity pattern. Yes, exactly, exactly. Because rigs has a quadrupolar component directly, you can see the quadrupolar, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, because then, then the transition is first order, at least numerically. So, yeah. So we didn't try. But the first part of the talk, maybe I misunderstood something simple. So in the Landau Lishitz equation, it's a classical equation. Uh, and you can derive it also by classical means. So your generalized Landau oh, so your generalized Landau Lipschitz equation, you uh yes. I mean derived it by you know taking a semi-classical limit. But if I yeah. wanted to just by purely classical means see where it comes from, is there a way to do it? Uh, the thing is, you know, this this so much bar in the formula. Yeah, right. I mean, there is no classical counterpart of a spin, right? So I mean, like, you know, these these quadrupolar moments, you know, come from the precisely from the quantum nature of the spin. Correct. So, and that is the reason why you know th there is more than one way of taking a classical limit, right? So, but, but the final formula, there's no h bar in the final formula. No, I mean it's hidden here, here, right? So, yeah. I mean we can discuss later. Yeah. You know why? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I guess it's a it's a related question. So like, so let's say you're given a Hamiltonian, right? Uh, some form, some lattice Hamiltonian. So how do you figure out like uh, whether I should use one over s or ah. one over m? Well, well, you know, okay. So there are two extreme cases where it is obvious, right? So I told you, you know, with 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 the, with this approach, with the usual one, you have one normal mode per spin. With the other one, you get two, right? So if you have a very strong single ion and isotropy that is binding magnums into a two magnum strong two magnum bound states, you will use the second approach, right? The SU three. Uh, you know, approach. If you are, if you have very weak and iso single ion and isotropy, and you only have magnons as collective modes, your quadrupole will be inside the two magnon continuum and will decay. So, in order to get that decay, you will need to do a one loop correction. Then, you know, you use SU2. You may ask me what in between, right? So, what in the middle? Well, you know, then you have to come from both sides, you know, with the loop expansion and see which one works better. Yeah. So, it's still a bit of an arc. Sorry? So no, no, yeah, you well, you know, it's otherwise we will all lose our jobs, right? So, <laughs> but no, no, I mean, like, um, it's, you know, something important that I didn't mention is this, even this, the classical theory, this one, right? Uh, you can get a renormalized classical theory if you start, for instance, with SU3, and then you, you constrain CP2 to CP1. Then you are going to get another classical Hamiltonian, in particular, whenever you have single ion and isotropy terms or any term that is quadratic or nonlinear in the spin operators of a given site, you will get a renormalization. And that renormalized classical theory will be better than, than this one, than the one that you get by simply replacing the spin operators with expectation values. And, and the simple reason is you are avoiding an approximation that is that the expectation value of a bilinear in spins is, is approximated by the product of the expectation values. You avoid that approximation. And consequently, you get a renormalized classical theory, even in this case. So even if you have a weak single ion isotropy, it's better to go first, you know, to take the classical limit with coherent states of SU3 or SUN, and then constraint to CP1. And the errors are big. I mean, so if you don't do that, you can get the single ion isotropy is wrong by factors of 10 or things like that especially for the high order Stevens operation. So, so, so that's only if your single line sort of uh, is constraining you to be in the z equal to zero. So if I have single line, easy access. Any then... single line, any, any Stevens operator that is quartic, for instance, or, or sixth order, you know, will, you will get it with, a, with an error that is a factor of 10 or, or even bigger if, if you do this, if you do the usual spin with it. And the reason is you are making a good- It's easy point that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's only the order. The, you know, if it's quadratic, quartic, or six or the coefficient, you can get it by group theory. It doesn't depend on it. I think it's a really good point for discussion. So let's take okay. Christian again. <laughs> and we started three thirty shock. Okay. <laughs> 
Uh, 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 I the uh, 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 so you need frustration, you, you need spiral. So, so the spiral is you need the frustration of competing in the And then you need some, you know, combination of single ion and isotropy and magnetic fields, or of course, the spiral is and it turns out that it is for spin interactions are elevated. So that's the reason why you know, one can easily find in metallic system. So the effective for spin interactions. Ask for the system. Yes, that's what it is. That's why it's in the middle. SX squared is equal to SY. No, it's the first year of the last year. Yeah. So it's a multi orbital system. But if I do thermal stage, there should be no problem. I mean, you can also go. I mean, maybe it's more the change and I need to prepare some problem stretch. The problems we see there are those coming up the dark blue dispersion. Well, it's up. So you can decide then maybe. So the question is where you want to go. Like, yeah, like, yes, like this, it depends on if you want to go to two really available is so just the the and that you go into this order state you approach it and and basically, you know, the transition is the more. Normally, in the metal knife support, I'm just like, we need to like, we we so I'm actually bringing this up because so if I have a fourth I would have a second So you're not you're just representing the spin up, spin down with the question maybe is Maybe it's the same. Well, like, 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 um, yeah. So this, this you can do. So I, 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 I,
And it's not that I have a Hamiltonian and then I look at the this way. Whatever you get from uh, exactly, that's right. Uh, right. Uh, so yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm not keeping track of it. I should leave it. And then, and that's, you know, uh, I, I really yeah. want to yeah. 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 yeah, so that's, that's why, I guess, I guess, you know, this introduction, you know, where, you know, yes. it's really, it's, 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 I think it's, it was very, very clear that the project, yeah, I, um, I, 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 but in addition, your Hamiltonian flow. Yeah, but in a very non trivial So, so if you look at, you know, what you have in the last four does, the Tory codes, you know, is this is this thing, you know, which is a school like now I can two different ones. I can deep from the Hamiltonian of your magnetic field. You know that would eventually you know the two inquiry uh, uh, Yes. And actually, that's the tradition where well, this wave function goes from being an interesting wave function. Always get a manly rate to the matter because it's a good idea. But it's a good idea. The three dehizing is three dehizing are different things. Yeah. Now, now, uh, for that, you know, trajectory where you change the wave function, you can reconstruct that would actually, you know, chart again out from the data. Yes. Um, well, yeah, For, you know, some of the works are getting to it. Oh, that again is really good. Yeah, and it's neighboring. Really looking at Tony. Yeah, yeah. so you know, it's it's a very constructed version. Um, so they're taking yeah. from so that's. Um, but in the next step of the measurement, it's a different. Like it. um, so it's basically. Yeah. So, yeah, so in my case, you know, this deformation comes comes from the uh, uh, measurement, so that makes you know this this higher level. You know, what is the measurement that would go along? You know, even more complicated. So so that's it's a, it's a wrong language. So, the, yeah. so that's that's why I'm saying the like, union is correct. So don't ask me. You know, yeah, what is yeah, the I Because also you know it it sets you you know for the for the suspension you know the the calculus took us here. So you know. Yeah, so you would have thought it's two so plus one, so but it's the, not. It was already in the same direction. So the the neighbor couplings are um, like the flow. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so it's, you know, um, it's, um, it's, um, it's like quantum hall. Where people but, also um, only work with that field, you know, they know, always started, you know, lower temperature. Okay. Oh, then they construct the them pretty so I think just this is not too effect. uncommon, but yeah, and it's of course still not. Yeah. 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 So, is it? yeah. so it, it's it's you know, so it's it's, 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 it's a it's a different mindset. Um, so let's ask one more question, and then I'm so in this when you were talking about this Nishimori, I mean that's where it was. So how you make sure that you follow this line? How that is? I I don't have the that dictate. So so how it is. Yeah. So bond through, yeah. Um, so the way that I think you know the, this order comes out of the main or lattice, but there yeah. are can be started for I to keep so the, the, well it's uh, it's the only tunable parameter that I have, so I don't need to see the other direction. So, yeah. so that one that is actually super interesting. Because you know, 40 the other side, you know, so Nishimori is sort of you know this 
staple I, of stuff like, yeah, yeah you know, science, 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 yeah, you know, we come to realize that it's two thirds of the one is look like the other. But the sit, you know, evidently it's frustrated because the way that you write down all these probabilities, it is exactly, you know, you see, I'll leave to There's no way for the quantum system to be free, you know, left or right. So what do you think? Yeah, they want to go forward or backward. Yeah. No, this is this is. But I was kind of so I didn't right. so, 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 we will uh, see a lot of more of the uh, So this okay. is okay. 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 these types of circuits now. Uh, I introduced a client there. So whenever you, you have a commutative uh, not more in there. No, no. really. So, so, uh, well, so, uh, 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 there's also a you know, 20 year old result from the vibration or a special calculation. It's incoherent, it's just random. And it's all this. That's an open You know, that also matters. So now we have done this with here, like so this weak uh, which is certainly different from other yes, or, uh, yeah, and it's also different from so, uh, so, so, so these things pop up all over the place. So it seems that that is, that that is you know, one of but, these um, important universality classes in, a very small in, volume in these rich uh, material that we so that's why I'm sort of poking my finger into you know, the, the fact that you don't know everything about this paper. And it's very unusual. Because that's an unusual case. Uh, you know, so uh, correlations don't get in there. Well, you know, this is the way ridiculous stuff happens. So yeah, it's very common. But it's complicated. It's resonator. It's no one to one to Hamiltonian. Yeah. But again, you know, it's then but we know that these things exist so can I you know we still need to train also to so we're only sensitive very narrow and then I was lost around the rest of the beginning you know His research will end if flight over simplification. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, multiple resonators, we use of the resonators, but basically, um, we just have this one or a few energies that we can look at, and then we can sweep magnetic fields. I really can. Um, I can use all these money if you get like. Um, so, um, good question. Uh, the, you should. Actually, uh, it's, um, okay, well, I guess you're fired. <laughs> no, I, I need to, I think I can probably answer your question, but I um, need to not think about it and check. But the, but if, if these were isolated spins and they were just spin one half, then, uh, then you might expect the same factor, uh, uh, G factor, and so. Yeah, when, like when, when, you, when you move through the resonator yeah, energy, you had it, uh, what's going to happen is you either couple the stems very strongly to the resonator and like, oh, the hybridization creates two no, lines instead of one, no, or um, it creates a new loss mechanism and it broadens the line. Mm -hmm. So, and these are non grammar so it means that it becomes me That's right. So, yeah. um, so the mm -hmm. The doublets that are that have been well, identified the through the uh, group theory analysis, and, um, they, they some of those doublets have um, components that differ by um, by one in the group. So they're uh, yeah. so they're like they have components of anything from S equals four and S equals five. Um, but that's in their case, equals four and no, no, equals five, no. and um, and and in the negative direction, and so so there should be 
Yes, it, it cannot be the best. Yes, and so yeah, that, 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 that is you need to like uh, and so to that in your so, self determined yes, point. Now we see that it's like, perfectly what the answer shows us at this point, and then compare the energy between different. I can show you some pictures of um, most of these, but we're still trying to nail down that we're seeing explicitly the film and not the substrate. The, the substrate, of course, you'd hope would be uh, nothing, but um, but it turns out for lattice constant match, we use uh, a substrate that does have some amount of defects. And uh, so we're trying to isolate this. Uh, so it's, uh, in terms of the, the interactions, we think it's very 2D. Right? Um, and I guess you cannot do music. So, and, so, yeah. and, so I think there's been a bit of neutron scattering on the, the bulk crystals. Um, it doesn't seem to be very informative yet. I, I think it's powder. Uh, uh, for the films, I don't think there's any hope. It's just uh, too small. The volume, though, conceivably x ray. But, uh, so, so yes, yeah, so because um because we can effectively make her cavity so small, so it can have significant so, so I, I mean so so ESR um yeah I mean, normally normally you need say ten to eighteen spins to fifteen spins some some uh, some some large number uh, in, in a film that's um, um, a film that's say 10 nanometers thick, if these were just all paramagnetic, you know, if every site just was a free spin, then, and if we're at low enough temperature that um, KT is substantially smaller than the, or at least comparable to the uh, transition, which we can get to, then um, let's say you have in each layer, um, several times 10 to the 14 um, spins. So you, you have a lot of spins uh, um, uh, in a square centimeter, but uh, but if you made a centimeter scale cavity, then it, uh, this would be a very small film. So instead we use a cavity that effectively has, uh, uh, penetrates a few microns down. So it's, so we're getting maybe, you know, 10 or 10 or 40 nanometers thick in uh, a few microns. And so it's say 1% filling uh, and that, that's, that's a, so we can, I guess the, the, the length of our cavity is maybe around a millimeter um, and um, the depth is enough to encompass the film. So, um, and the width is say five microns. So we have um, on the preferred per centimeter square. Say we have ten to the fifteen spins. Then we have a millimeter to, to make it simple. A millimeter by ten microns. That would be on yeah, um, it's pretty crazy. Times the minus one, then times the minus three centimeters, so times the minus four. You have at times the eleven spins, maybe times the ten, and yes, that's that's enough. That that's we can, uh, and the, our reason for developing some of this technology is to be able to uh, uh, more a systems where it's even uh, even more diluted. Uh, but yeah, but here we, we can see. Uh, I need to. Uh, I, um, um, I need to think about that. Um, um, so we can. So what we can do is. Um, with the resonators we have right now, we can use the fundamental three times that, five times that. So we have three frequencies. We can also put more more resonators, and so we can study this more densely. But right now we have three points, and there it does seem to be linear. Um, so that's um, uh, but so we see a number of modes, and we're right now trying to disentangle 
which ones are substrate related, which ones are um, in the film. And uh, I, I think we'll probably, the week after, after March meeting, we'll probably clarify that because um, it's just, um, yeah, so, so the, the, the long paper. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yes. So, but if they're, so, so maybe if we, if we get a chance, I can step through what we, coming from a naive point of view, what we've been trying to build up in understanding there. And, and then if you think, if you have questions or suggestions for what kinds of techniques might be brought to bear to understand those systems. Yeah, and, no. <laughs> yeah, so we, we've mostly tried to understand what does um, what does spin orbit and uh, crystal fields do in terms of creating the uh, creating the spectrum, and then a bit about nearest neighbor interactions. Um, though uh, certainly not the uh, not the last. Well, but yeah, I'm interested in because here you can see the so, so for the things where you interact, with, I understand why you interact with neutron scatterers. They're right there, but do you have a sense of to what extent? Do you want to get coffee or? Sure. 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 Maybe I'll bring my computer and so we we have a moment. I'll show you the. <音>你也会说我还是想的话 想到要用这种东西说，算了。这个这个方面在他们做不一定是自己学习，他们做别的调查。用吗？但是你看，它的质量情况下也是可以安全品。你有什么？什么的安全？就是你那个，就是你。自己跟自己的互信息就是安全品那我们就是可以你可以看一下那个公式挺好的因为它它是描述两个东西它的信息而且你取一个随机的的确算出来互信息是一个 
Yes, to be feel the only Thanks for your opinion. I'm sure I'm not doing that. I Okay, it's pretty good. So it's time to start. Uh, okay, so uh, the second part of the afternoon today, uh, the first of it is uh, by Lucille Savarin from Sinners in the Room. And Pat is, okay, you can say it is out. So, French American Okay, French American Center for Theoretical Science. Now yeah. everybody knows it. <laughs> but it's kind of in the talk. So, uh, and you will tell us about uh, kinematic equation approach and the example for that important alternative in my title for both. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Is that better? I see. No. Bring up. Is that better? Yes. All right. Uh, well, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for having me here. Um, uh, Natasha invited me for a seminar in October, and I really liked it. So, I'm very happy to be back. Um, so, the work I've been uh, I'm going to talk to you about has been in the works for uh, quite a few years now. It took a while. Um, it was done uh, with my student, who's now a postdoc in Munich, and with um, Leo Monchal and with Leon Balance at KITP. So um, the uh, first uh, paper is here. I will probably actually not have time or time much time or time at all to talk about them, uh, but let's see. And uh, the story I'm going to tell you uh, today. Um, in addition to the overview, is um, uh, is well, appeared on the archive a few days ago, and um, there'll be a follow up soon. And then there's some uh, other paper uh, regarding fermions, which should also come uh, out soonish. Um, so uh, what I uh, would like to start with, so. What I'm really going to be talking about is kinetic equations and semi-classical approximations. Um, and what semi-classical approximations are, are used for, at least in the context I'm going to be talking about, is typically to, um, or one way to see them anyway, is a way to have a, a, a quite physical and physically understandable approach to understand a transport phenomena. And in fact, when one talks about uh, semi-classical approximations in this context, um, there are, in fact, um, typically actually two different kinds of approximations, which are very often treated uh, independently um, and which we will be um, considering in, in one shot in this paper and in some sense uh, rederiving. So there, there are two notions, two kind of semi-classical approximations. Uh, one is uh, typically known as uh, Boltzmann's equation, and it's an approximation for a distribution of particles. And uh, here, you know, one of the approximations in this equation, okay, so n would be the um, the number of, of particles in state, uh, so the expectation value of the number operator in state n and at momentum k of some, of some particles. Um, and then, you know, in a small volume of phase space centered at position R moment NK. Uh, and what you'll see here, it's definitely not quantum, not fully quantum, because um, you you don't have the full uh, density matrix appearing here. 
but only um, the expectation value of the diagonal elements. There is no uh, quantum coherence between different uh, states. There is another semi-classical approach, which is in particular um, a very uh, uh, famous for transport, which is a, a semi-classical approximation for actually the center of um, of the center of a, of a wave packet. Okay. Um, and it's just for one particle. So it's an effective description uh, here for, you know, an electron, for example, uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in a conducting system uh, where one would be, X would be the, the center of um, mass of the, uh, of the particle and K it's a momentum. And uh, over the years, uh, theories were developed. It started uh, more or less in, with Karplus and Nettinger in the 50s. And kind of the final uh, version was given in Sundar, by Sundaram or, or kind of encompassing uh, version was given by Sundaram and New in 1999, where you see that the velocity um, is the group velocity um, corrected by an anomalous velocity which takes into account the Berry curvature, et cetera, of the, of the, of the band. Um, but so these two things are actually typically tra treated independently. Um, no, sorry. Um, this is kind of a picture of what I was uh, saying before. Um, uh, and, um, and as far as the second one goes, uh, you know, it's very nice, obviously, but it's somewhat ad, ad hoc. There is some approximation of this wave packet. We're going to follow its center. Uh, and it also doesn't naturally uh, extend to higher order. As we will see, it is actually a um, an expansion to first order of what we'll be doing. So why would we want to combine the two approaches? Um, well, first of all, just as a theoretical exercise, it's interesting. Uh, it's more elegant to also be able to, to understand everything in one shot. Um, it's not so clear, for example, if you take the, you know, the, the new uh, formulas, uh, how you might include collision integrals or some uh, other interactions, um, which uh, we will be able to do. Uh, you can also go to higher order um, and in fact obtain, for example, nonlinear conductivity terms it's less ad hoc as there will be an explicit and systematic derivation of how to obtain the equations. And as I kind of alluded to, you can actually access the thermal uh, Hall effect for electrical insulators okay. in a semi-classical way. So um, let me remind you um, how the, uh, how the, you know, this uh, semi-classical equations from a uh, new worked. Uh, well, so, you know, the, the idea was that you would then now define a current, which would be um, the uh, um, um, the filling factor in band N, and then you would have a velocity, uh, which, uh, you know, would be the group velocity, and then it was found that it should be corrected by an anomalous velocity, which includes Berry curvature effects, so the geometry of the bands. Uh, um, and, you know, at the end of the day, you would obtain an anomalous Hall effect, uh, which would include this anomalous velocity. And in fact, you know, what was very satisfying is you can actually recover from this, the TKNN formula in, um, in the special case of the Hall effect. Okay. Uh, but again, this comes kind of a, from a, a, you know, relatively a doc uh, procedure. Um, now, um, what was proposed uh, actually in papers uh, that are not so um, famous um, is a systematic expansion in small gradients, um, which will kind of justify this uh, semi-classical approach and um, where with, uh, which we've uh, done for bosons uh, and extended. The other approach, so so far, you know, I mean, you can you can compute transport, of course, in different ways, and and the uh, other procedure for computing transport is, of course, the Kubo formula. And if you're thinking about electrical transport, 
uh, there is a kind of very well defined, uh, extensively used uh, procedure, which is to, uh, you know, you include the source term to your Hamiltonian, then you can do it in your response. Uh, this is the sort of thing you teach in a, in a class and you obtain the, the Kubo formula for the electrical conductivity, which is the correlation function of, a, of the current operators, the total currents in a real space. For thermal transport, however, uh, because you know you, when you think about electrical transport, you think of putting a, a, a gradient of potential, okay? And then the gradient of potential, you can put this in the Hamiltonian. But actually a gradient of temperature uh, doesn't have a formulation in the Hamiltonian, whereas there is no temperature, okay? So you need a trick. And uh, Langer introduced a trick, which was to include, uh, you know, which was a way to include into a Hamiltonian formulation, a source term, which would mimic a thermal gradient. And so this is, uh, you know, in his paper done very clearly, uh, you introduce what is it's called gravitational potential. Uh, and there's an equation that you can solve, which will relate this to uh, your, you know, a, a thermal gradient. And then you couple this to a local Hamiltonian density. And eventually what you obtain is a Kubo formula, which is, looks just like the electrical uh, Kubo formula, but there's a, a one over T. Um, which be there in any case for uh, dim dimensions. However, um, it's been known uh, since the works of Smeda and Spreka and perhaps uh, before by others, I'm not sure, that um, this is actually not the transport current in the sense that it is not the current that you would be measuring if you were to do a, a, a sorry, it's not the, yeah, so it's not the, 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 the thermal conductivity that you would be measuring if you were doing an experiment. It must actually be corrected by a magnetization current term. Uh, if you read papers about this, there's also uh, you know, one way that you can computationally see it is actually that if you just compute this, you might get divergences that need to be fixed by some extra term, okay? And so um, and nevertheless, you know, this, this formula, first of all, it's kind of, nice because it extends the uh, uh, electrical conductivity formula, um, but also it can be used. I mean, there's a procedure to use it. And in fact, for the you know thermal Hall effect in insulating systems where you're not gonna be using um, the law whose name I've forgotten, Wiedemann's France, um, <laughs> the, um, there's been derivations of the thermal Hall effect uh, for you know the thermal Hall uh, coefficient for these systems, okay? Um, and we'll come later to how can you actually even generate a Hall effect for, the, for a system which doesn't even couple to the magnetic field, but we'll come to this uh, later. Um, and there were in fact theories, uh, early theory was uh, by Patrick Lee, um, but in fact, uh, what they missed here was this, this magnetization current term, which was later uh, corrected um, in these papers. Uh, there was also a theory uh, for phonons, again, creating a thermal Hall effect of phonons. And again, there was some uh, formulas which corresponded, might not be obvious, but they correspond exactly to one another. Um, and again, in this uh, formulation, you see these kind of weird terms uh, which come from having to introduce this magnetization energy and magnetization current. Um, so two observations here. Uh, first of all, uh, so this is using the Kubler your formula. So you need to have this magnetization uh, to, to figure out how to include this magnetization current. Um, it also, um, you know, some of these papers have some kind of Again, ad hoc assumptions, okay? So we would like to not have to uh, go through this. And finally, uh, there is no kinetic equation formulation here. In fact, these are you know, based on Kubo's formula, which is inherently quantum, but the uh, expressions here uh, look very classical. I mean, they look kind of just like the formulas that we get from the um, newspaper for electrons, okay? So uh, we'd like to uh, resolve this. And so this is what uh, we're gonna do. So uh, when we talk about kinetic equations uh, in the back of your head, in mind, you should be thinking about uh, Boltzmann's equation and they can, 
you agree the formula are correct, right? There's no 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 mistake. There are no mistakes. No. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and the, the corrected formula. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question about that formula. It involves only the berry phase, so particularly for polynomials, but skew scattering would also be there. So why? Yeah. So this is a this. In fact, uh, so this is a formula for intrinsic thermal Hall effect, assuming only that you have a phase um, uh, uh, band curvature effects. So there's no. And this doesn't include interactions. Um, but these are in But you need impurities, right? To have a oh. This is Hall. So that's oh, another thing I get I couldn't see. So for Hall, you don't need to have dissipation. Right? Sorry, no get... Sorry? No one over tau. No, no, the one over tau here. Um, so that's another point, I guess, is, is with these formulations, in fact, without, uh, you know, including uh, by hand uh, some. Um, uh, scattering, you wouldn't be able to get a. It's just completely analogous to TKK and formula for thermal. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. For insulators, this is for. I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> but it's the analogous thing. Yeah. Yes. So they look, yes. Okay. Okay. So. Um, uh, so we will break up the indeed the kinetic equation into two parts. Uh, one uh, which will have which will include these uh, intrinsic effects, so band curvature effects, uh, and will include also uh, what will come into a collision term. So actual you know real scattering with external particles, for example, where you might have indeed a dissipation, etc. And then the left hand side will include and a virtual scattering, so uh, band curvature effects, and in fact, other kinds of uh, band geometry effects. Okay. Um, and I probably won't have time uh, to talk about uh, this bit, okay, um, which is probably more relevant to experiment, uh, but this is uh, perhaps more uh, theoretically um, interesting. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the left hand side now. And indeed, we're going to forget about having any collision terms. But the, the kind of the nice, the nice aspect of the procedure is these can be included naturally. We're done. OK. So if we're going to be uh, you know, giving a semi-classical approach uh, and a you know, kinetic equation, uh, the point is to start with a hydrodynamic description. OK. And, um, what really happens in a hydrodynamic description is you're going to be making a separation of scales, okay? Um, and this is where the fact that we're, we're going to have both X and P dependence is going to come in and we're going to treat them at the same time, okay? So there is a separation of scale because there is a microscopic scale, okay? And then there's going to be um, an external perturbation uh, and also kind of a... Uh, uh, let's say localness at the scale of a much uh, longer uh, at this length scale, which is much longer than the lattice scale. Okay, and we'll also assume a local equilibrium, which is uh, very kind of nicely explained in this uh, paper. Uh, and we will be able to, uh, you know, one of the the nice things which you also can't get with Kubo is that you can access here all the local currents and all the local effects. But for, for looking at it, you need some, some perhaps even an elastic scattering, right? So, sorry, for, for the locality, you need some perhaps even in elastic scattering, right? I guess it's yes, it's probably, I mean, you need some, yes, you need to be driven to equilibrium. Yeah. Uh, but I, this, um, in the, in the derivation doesn't come in at all, like just the. Probably what you want to be saying is, in fact, you know that there should be some equilibrium. But when you're solving, for example, it's like the basically you were going to get a continuity equation. And the continuity equation. Um, as long as there's no boundaries. It's so we will have a boundary, but the boundary will be smooth. Um, so, yes, this is actually an important point. 
Uh, but, but it seems to be a disconnect between the previous slide and this one. You just said that you don't want any collisions, and all of a sudden we talk about aerodynamic regime. I mean, how how we? Well, okay. Um, I'm not sure how to answer this question, but we're talking about locality, so maybe okay. So what I want to say is that we're going to be able to have a so the the energy is going to be locally conserved, okay. Uh, and there's going to be a local continuity equation, which is going to be true without a term on the right hand side. And I think that's all perfectly well defined. So perhaps if you want the notion of a local equilibrium and super well defined, I don't know if it's possible. This is not okay, but um, it's all right. <laughs> if you do linear uh, linear response, you don't need to have uh, you know chemical potential and things like that uh, locally uh, uh, defined. You can, you can consider linear deviation from but equilibrium. It, it's going to be fine. Yeah. Anyway, at, at here, there's at the beginning, there's no linear response whatsoever. It's just we write down a Hamiltonian. Okay. So j just a quick question. So uh, for fermions on that yes. separation of scale uh, line, there would have been uh, Fermi wavelengths, right? Yes, I think somebody already asked me this question. Right. Uh, now, is there a temperature for for your bosons for bosons there, oh, or what one lower temperature other? Yeah, so I think so. If you read, for example, this, so there is there's in fact several scales. So there's like a there's really a long scale, and then there is a. So when you're defining the local, it's actually you know maybe a meso scale that it should be. So it's local, not. I, maybe I should have had three scales. Okay, I went a bit fast. So there's a scale where you have many sites, but you don't still don't have a scale, which is the order of the size of the system. This is, I think, not too important here. Okay. So, um, so what we will do, uh, just, you know, if you had enough already, uh, what we are doing at the end of the day is we are deriving a quantum kinetic equation for bosons, uh, which um, we derive it exactly and then we make approximations. It's general enough that it can be applied to any bosonic modes, so take your pick. And it does not rely on including a fictitious gravitational field and it can also include homogeneities, which allow us to include boundaries, for example. So um, I'll just go really quickly on this, but so you have an idea of what we, you know, the kinds of, because it's all going to be very general. I'm just going to have H's, okay? Uh, but in the back of your head, uh, you could be thinking of these kinds of uh, Hamiltonian densities. So for example, it could be an isotropic elasticity, okay? Uh, including a, a phonon Hall viscosity, so a time reversal breaking term, which you can obtain microscopically. Uh, because of, for example, phonons interacting with magnons and then you integrate out the magnons, okay? Um, you can also have a theory, your bosons could be magnons, okay? Uh, and in order to get a Hall effect, you would want to have a, a term coupling your longitudinal to your, uh, sorry, your net to your um, uh, antiferromagnet, uh, a nail and net magnetization. Okay. So these are the kinds of systems <laughs> you might want to have in mind. Uh, this was I was mentioning. I don't have time to go through it, but um, you there's a you can there's a term that you can write down at the lowest order, which couples uh, the strain to the stress. Okay, and uh, this is the coefficient of this. The, the coefficient is called the phonon Hall viscosity, and if you were to imagine it came microscopically from coming from coupling phonons to magnons. Um, then it would take this form of a correlation function of, of the magnum operator. All right. So how do we proceed uh, to carry out this program? Uh, so I mentioned it would be valid for any bosonic field. So we define bosonic fields. Okay. And uh, in this uh, in this operator here, we include both uh, you know the bosonic field and its conjugate. Okay. So it's kind of doubled compared to what you'd um, have um, so you include both uh, field and its conjugate, and then uh, what we've restricted ourselves so far to are quadratic Hamiltonians. Because the next step would be to include 
interacting Hamiltonians. And so we include any, we, we consider any uh, Hamiltonian, which can be spatially dependent. There, there does not need to be any translational invariant. All you need is that it's Hermitian. And then from there, you know, you can define uh, an object gamma, which will be the commutation relations. And uh, requirements of, of hermeticity uh, basically uh, require that you, there's a few constraints on these objects. Okay. And then um, you build the observables. Okay. And the observable, then you look at the two-point two uh, function of observables. And these, these kinds of objects are something called the density matrix. Okay. It's not just actually density, it could be uh, here any A and any B. Okay, so the UU, UP, BP correlation functions. And then you use Hamilton's equation of motion. And if you do this, um, you end up with the equation of motion for the, the operators phi that are related to uh, convolution between K, which is uh, gamma H with this phi. And you can find an exact kinetic equation. This is a definition of a kinetic equation for the Fs. So at this point, you might not be so convinced. This is very useful. It's, it's very abstract. There's a convolution. We hate dealing with this, OK? Uh, but by upon doing a Wigner transform, things are going to become uh, magically much simpler. So the idea here is that we always have two points, OK? So the, these are matrices, but they also depend on two points in space, OK? And so we're going to do a, a transform of the Fourier transform of the relative coordinates and then keep track of the uh, center of mass. OK. Um, and what happens when you do this is actually this horrible convolution turns into what is called a star product or Morial product. And the Morial product is defined in this way. OK. Um, and this is really the expansion of this, which is going to provide a systematic derivation and expansion of any order that you want in the kinetic equation. And at first order, we will recover actually Boltzmann's equation with all the um, with all the uh, geometric terms. So uh, it's a little bit fun to play with these things. Um, you end up with a, you know, this kinetic equation. It's uh, extremely simple. Uh, still questions, right? So, oh, a minute. Still questions. Okay, great. Um, uh, but then it's still a matrix equation, and as you usually do when you have a matrix equation, you actually need to diagonalize it. But it's a diagonalization in Moyal space. Okay, so it's a star diagonalization. Um, but nevertheless, uh, there exists some uh, operators here. Some, actually, some this point, some matrices which are functions also of x and k, um, and they become Stargen values, and also uh, eigenvalues of this density matrices. Okay, uh, in the star product sense. Um, then what happens, okay, again, these are, you know, kind of formal constructions, although they can work with them uh, exactly. But when you want to try to do, uh, yes. Uh, but I only have four minutes. So. <laughs> um, so um, if you actually want to, you know, recover the, the Boltzmann equation you were looking at and I've been claiming is the first order approximation of all this doesn't have star, uh, star stars here. Okay, so you want to expand this. Uh, and it's the expansion of this kinetic equation. You can already see here starts to look like the Boltzmann equation. Um, so there are many kind of intricate things because this guy is not actually Hermitian. And so they're left and right starting values. Um, but at the end of the day, you can construct uh, exactly uh, the energy density. Um, once you take the derivative of this using Hamilton's equation of motion, you get an equation, and by identify and you can identify you get a divergence and you phase space divergence, and you can identify the current, i.e., the object, which makes this vanish. Okay, and you can show that this is actually should always be the case because of properties of, of the Moyal brackets, okay? And now you get uh, a phase space current, 
which you see is uh, this uh, derivative of k times something which will play the role of the energy density. Um, it turns out, and this is perhaps more for the experts, although it's, it's a little bit important because, uh, for example, we expect that all these kind of uh, side jump effects, et cetera, come from this. But in any case, if you want to maintain its uh, gauge invariance when you start diagonalize this object, uh, you should actually shift the coordinates um, to a different coordinate. So the kind of the gauge potential that appears actually ends up shifting the kinetic coordinates to others. Um, and when you do this using these new coordinates, you obtain at first order exactly uh, Boltzmann's equation uh, with all the usual Berry phase effects, group velocity. Um, you have Berry phases that are cross terms and Berry phases uh, between K and X. And, um, yes. Um, if we want, at the end of the day, I was saying we were very motivated by getting the thermal current. Okay. So let us look at what, what this, what this is, if we expand it, um, if we expand it, we actually can, um, um, split it into two, uh, independently gauge invariant currents. One, which is a current, which looks just like the one you would expect. Okay. And one, which we can identify to be the magnetization current. So this kind of elusive current um, that we were talking about actually uh, comes out right here. It's an it's a it's a phase space curl. Um, this is actually a physical quantity. It's gauge invariant. Um, one question we have is, can one actually uh, measure it? Okay, question, but it seems like it should be the case since it's uh, well defined. Um, as I mentioned, we can recover uh, this formula without using any kind of gravitational potential. Okay. Um, we can indeed obtain the two currents, the magnetization currents and the transport current, the thing that you would actually be measuring. Uh, and here we've included a boundary by including a, a function which vanishes outside, say, our sample boundary. And we see that uh, we actually have only currents localized along the edges that are counter-propagated. Uh, what we think is that our theory, and it's, this is really uh, almost done, but the theory will really shine when we, uh, since we can apply this to actual textures. So, if, for example, we're doing skirmions, uh, we can measure, well, measure. Uh, compute the local currents around uh, skirmions. And, uh, okay, I'll just stop here. Thank you. Yes, you are first. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I have a question regarding your exact kinetic equation. Yes. Normally, when you derive the equation of motion for the one body Wigner function, or distribution function, you end up not with one equation, but with a Bogolubov Born Green Kirkwood Devon hierarchy of equations that couple the one body Victor function to the two body, Victor function, two body to the three body, and so on. And to deal with this chain of equation, you have to decouple them somehow using RPA or whatnot. Yeah. How come that you end up with a single equation? It can happen in one and only one situation if you completely disregard the interactions. Then one bother, why bother at all? Why, 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 why not solving single body quantum mechanics? Um, so first of all, it's a, it's not a, it's not a, um, so it's a, this is a matrix equation. Okay. And these are functions and this is a star product. So it's non-local. It's That's one body the, function, right? Sorry? It's a one particle, one, one body function, right? Well, so these are two point functions. The Fs are two point functions, and we have a quadratic Hamiltonian. So uh, at no point does anything beyond there, there's no F star F anywhere. So we don't ever encounter uh, higher point functions. Um, if we include interactions, and in fact, when we include collisions, um, using the simple form of this equation, there are higher point functions, in fact, four point functions that will 
be the only ones that can tell you about the whole effect. So that and, uh, the answer is that there are no interactions, basically. In this first part, so that's what we want, well, we want to do next. But in this, what I presented here, there are no interactions. Ah, okay, that's clear. Sounds good. So, um, so you like at, at the end, you said that you thought that this formalism would really shine mm -hmm. in the context of um, uh, spin textures. Or, um, um, I wonder what about, um, say, moires that have textures in um, very curvature, or uh, so if you have some periodic, spatially periodic. Um, variations in things that look sort of like magnetization. Yeah, I mean, so all this in principle, so again, we don't have interactions here. Sure. Um, but, you know, we can really input any Hamiltonian that we'd like um, and then solve it. You know, once you expand it, you actually solve it. Um, once you expand it, the star products become regular products, and then you can diagonal. And, and would it be possible to, um, uh, even though you don't have interactions explicitly in there, would it be possible to uh, extract torques from this? Uh, so if you have um, um, some uh, some spin or uh, angular momentum. That... Yeah, I mean, so here we don't. So here, for example, I mean, again, you can ask in principle, if you include interactions, you could say that your spin structure. Uh, yeah, so no. I guess, so what we really extract from here, we do extract very curvatures, energy magnetization, energy currents, local things, etc. Uh, another thing that I haven't done, and which probably relates to your torque question, because you want to see if they move, for example, or well, I, I if we could include the time dependence, which we haven't done. I, I guess even if you don't include the time dependence, mm -hmm. if you just look at the flow of a, um, if you are scattering that that changes the angular momentum of the uh, particles or the quantum numbers of the particles, then you could say, well, that should in turn exert a torque on the environment. Yeah, I haven't thought about it, but it sounds, yeah, it sounds interesting. Uh, um, yes. Uh, Great. Yeah, yeah. A question, maybe somewhat related to David's question. Uh, so imagine the texture is periodic. Uh, uh -huh. Does this formalism capture the formation of mini bands? <clears throat> uh... You know, if you have a, like a, just the no intacting uh, particles uh, in the presence of some periodic uh, uh, texture <coughs> lattice. Yes. Uh, so like the moraine materials, uh, does this uh, formalism capture the uh, formation of these mini bands? Yeah. Um, I just haven't thought about this at all, like uh, because we weren't looking at actually actually seeing what was stabilizing the structures, and we would, we're looking for the yeah for the. Maybe we can talk later, but it, it's possible, yes. I mean, there is nothing that prevents you from studying. In fact, it's easier to study something periodic than to study something with a boundary. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, your formalism is a piece of good as the old formula, which does capture the, 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 the more common yeah. formula, which, which will get those bands. But so my question really is related, what new observables can you get with your formalism that you couldn't get from the other formulas? Well, so first of all, the Murakami formula, so there, there's, uh, yeah. they compute the the conductivity, Yeah. but there is no, you know, derivation of the current in the way that we do. Yeah. There's no connection. The okay, but it's, there's the energy density. But is that energy density you're defining or the energy current you're defining, are they experimentally measurable locally? Oh, I think so. Yes, they're so they're a gauge invariant. They satisfy everything that. So we have in the paper we have a whole section about why we think that this magnetization current that we have is actually the real magnetization current. It's not just some random curl that you could be adding. Mm -hmm. um, and you can go to higher order. So what we expect actually that there'll be the the next order term at the quadratic term will include some um, the quantum geometric tensor uh, because that's kind of then you can get the symmetric stuff to appear. 
So there's definitely more. Great. So uh, I thought that there's, I mean, there is a physical uh, comparison of the more uh, pattern lengths and, and some kind of equilibration because uh, you, you use uh, local uh, Fermi functions, Boltzmann functions. Use locally equilibrium functions. Yeah, but that comes so yes, so that comes at the end. So the the whole derivation. So in order, you know, when we were recovering these formulas, indeed, you have to to include some equilibrium functions. Yeah. So if you you know otherwise, you could include also some. So basically, in order to kind of finish the calculation, you have to input this equilibrium thing. But up to that point, there is nothing. There is no equilibrium whatsoever. Right. So this doesn't, all of this is, you don't need, so F here is, is undetermined. We can take it light, but I mean, my point is that it's a left-hand side, so to speak, of, uh, 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 of the Boltzmann equation. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a dynamical side. And in principle, I may have some smooth potential, which is included in the smooth potential, or I may have a potential that modifies the spectrum of particles. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that might be related to this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a question basically uh, for skills. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Maybe, uh, okay, yeah. Yes. Sorry. Anton, last question. Does your theory apply to charged bosons or does it assume that the both bosonic modes are neutral? What I mean is that if they are charged and the in the magnetic field, right, then magnetic translation versus ordinary. I think that's yes. So, I mean, it's a good question. So, um, <laughs> what we're doing now is actually applying it to fermions, so we can, um, you know, for example, look at local currents around superconducting vortices, etc. Um, we haven't included a field yet, but so when you start including a magnetic field for charged bosons, then you all have another gauge invariance, which is different, completely different from the one. I, well, okay, different from the one I was talking about, which is the gauge invariance related to the gauge potential of the magnetic field. Um, and then, yes, there will be uh, presumably some more effects. So, so far, this is for neutral bosons. This formulation here, uh, I mean, I guess it depends what you put. OK, you could put it, I think. Um, but for example, if we do, we haven't really specified. How is it? It's a good point. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Go on. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay. So next talk is from Dr. Mitchell from John Hopkins University, and the talk will be about field theory of non-linear non Trying to switch off the mirroring. You can't do it in the new. <laughs> okay. I think it works. All right. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me here. It's a really warm welcome in Minnesota compared to the East Coast. Uh, it's going to be a balmy plus 20 degrees centigrade uh, on Sunday. And then it'll plunge down to zero. Um, all right, so I'm going to tell you a story about uh, our recent work on um, field theories of non collinear antiferromagnets. Um, 
I was done with uh, uh, my graduate students who are here. Um, we were asked to start with an overview of the field. And um, I'm taking a long view uh, of what we call the field going back to the 1930 um, and uh, the, the, the works of uh, Heisenberg, Betty, and Landau Lipschitz. Um, so that's basically the story of modern magnetism, uh, starting with the exchange interactions and the first theory, um, uh, field theory of a ferromagnet that was written down by Landau and Lipschitz, actually written by Lipschitz and of course, uh, the usual story there. Uh, and uh, the list is selective. It doesn't include many very worthy papers here. Um, uh, so I'm skipping from there to the 1980s when there was a, a, a split of activity. Uh, uh, when uh, first Pariyakhtar and Ivanov writ, uh, wrote down a field theory uh, for a simple antiferromagnet, nail antiferromagnet. So they're, they're, their equation was basically the uh, uh, adaptation of the landau lipschitz equation uh, to antiferromagnets. And uh, shortly thereafter, Andrei von Marchenko wrote uh, uh, a very uh, nice but very mysterious paper about uh, general types uh, of uh, dynamics in, in magnets, including antiferromagnets and spin glasses, uh, which many people cite, but maybe not many people understand. Uh, Took me a while to figure it out. Uh, in the 80s, also Duncan Haldane was working on, on the subject, and uh, his his work on the antiferromagnetic Heisenberg chain uh, uh, brought up some very interesting discoveries that were deemed worthy of a Nobel Prize uh, later, such as the Haldane gap uh, in integer spin uh, chains and absence thereof in, in half integer spin chains. Uh, which was ultimately linked to the presence of a topological term in the field theory. Uh, uh, Dimmer and Reed uh, uh, later, and also Duncan Haldane, uh, tried to look for a topological term uh, and similar Haldane gap uh, phenomena in higher dimensions. Uh, but their conclusion was that there was no such topological term in, on the square lattice or triangular lattice. Uh, and I also would like to mention uh, the extension of the field theories in a somewhat imaginary direction of large M uh, by uh, uh, Subir Sajdev and Nick Reed. Uh, and also the work on uh, deconfined criticality, which also had uh, the uh, uh, field theory of uh, antiferromagnets in there. Uh, and then uh, people have moved on to working on lattice theories, lattice gauge theories and such things. And so here we are in 2024. I'd like to uh, bring us back and, and do some uh, field theory of, of antiferromagnets, basically starting with a classical limit. So just a quick reminder of what landau lefschetz equation is uh, for a ferromagnet. Uh, so you have um, uh, gently waving spins that don't change very much from one side to the next. And so you describe this in terms of a continuous uh, function, a unit vector valued field, M of X and T in one dimension. Um, and then you can describe the spins in terms of this uh, uh, field, evaluating it at discrete positions. Um, the landau lipschitz equation basically is uh, the balance of uh, the rate of change of angular momentum on the left-hand side and uh, whatever torque comes uh, from potential energy. And the potential energy functional could be various things, but usually it's dominated by exchange interaction, which in, imposes a penalty for having a spatial variations of, of the magnetization field. And it might have an isotropies and other interesting terms such as Delshinsky, Moria, and so on. Um, there's a similar equation for an antiferromagnet, which you can also write down as the balance of uh, the rate of change of, of the uh, uh, density of angular momentum in an antiferromagnet, which is now written in a different way in terms of another unit vector field of staggered magnetization or staggered spin. So here spins change from up to down. So you cannot use a field theory literally. So you'll have to uh, do something else. And so here you can use still a single vector field to describe this configuration, as long as you introduce the staggering in the relationship between the staggered field and, and the actual spins. 
Uh, and the energy functional looks actually pretty similar to ferromagnets. It's again dominated by uh, the uh, exchange interaction uh, as the largest term, and then there are weaker anisotropies. Uh, and so again, on the right hand side, you have a conservative torque, and on the left hand side, you have the uh, density of angular momentum rate change of rate. Uh, so this, this equation was written uh, by Barek Ivanov in 1979, and independently, uh, this field theory was, was developed in, in, uh, in the West, and Duncan Haldane among the uh, culprits. Uh, and so uh, these equations of motion can be, of course, written, uh, obtained from some sort of an action. Uh, and this is the action for an antiferromagnetic chain. If you take this action and, and you minimize it, uh, you get the equations of motion uh, that, that were written on the previous page. Uh, however, that uh, reverse engineering, obtaining uh, an action from the equations of motion, misses an important term uh, that is silent uh, in the action. Uh, as long as the classical equations of motion go, this term has no influence on them because uh, it, it's proportional to a topological invariant. And a topological invariant is something that doesn't change if you make small uh, uh, deviations, uh, 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 small variations. And that means that it has zero variations, so it has uh, no contribution to the classical creation of motion. However, it has an, an important influence on quantum mechanics uh, of the system. Uh, and so because the uh, this piece of action it turns out to be proportional to an integer number times the spin length times two pi. If you exponentiate it, uh, it could be uh, only plus one for integer spins, uh, but it could be plus or minus one for half integer spins. And that creates the possibility of destructive interference uh, for various quantum trajectories, only for half integer spins, but not for integer spins. And that's where the suppression of the energy gap, uh, the Haldane gap, uh, comes from in uh, intermediate chains with integer spins. Uh, another important influence this topological term has, uh, aside from uh, these quantum mechanical effects, it also influences conserved quantities, such as the spin of a domain wall. Uh, if you evaluate uh, uh, the uh, conserved quantity known as the uh, spin, uh, just by using uh, this classical part of the action without the topological term, you will find that this domain wall uh, in an easing like uh, antiferromagnet doesn't have any spin. And so it's this term that's responsible for uh, giving spin S uh, uh, to, to the domain walls for spin S one half. It's, uh, 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 these domain walls carry spin half and they're known as spin-ons uh, in this field. And uh, it was first shown in a very technical paper by Fadeev and Dr. John, uh, uh, but then realized for, for many other contexts. So topological terms are important. Uh, at least it was demonstrated for one plus one dimensional uh, uh, systems. And so people naturally started looking for them in higher dimensions uh, and, and uh, in two plus one dimensions. Square lattice, it turns out, doesn't have this term. It cancels out when you add the contributions from uh, uh, chains, if you slice your square lattice into chains, uh, they all cancel out. And uh, on a triangular lattice, there's a rather different story. The field theory is quite different. You can't write it anymore in terms of uh, a single vector field because your spins point every which way. So a single vector is not enough. And so you have to invent uh, uh, some other kind of water parameter, which uh, uh, in this case, you can think of, of your three sublattice magnetizations on a triangular lattice as a Mercedes-Benz logo, uh, which is like a rigid body, right? If it's a rigid body, you can uh, describe its orientation um, in terms of some SO3 rotation matrix. So different orientations correspond to different choices of, the, of, the, of these rotation matrices. And you can construct a field theory in terms of such matrices, and, and this is what the field theory looks like. There's a kinetic energy and uh, stiffness, uh, uh, the price for having a non-uniform water parameter. Uh, this was written down by Dummer and Reed. And their primary goal in this work was to determine whether there's a topological term. And they guessed that the topological term could be written 
in a way similar to the uh, uh, one plus one dimensional case, although there'll be a different number of uh, space-time dimensions this time. And the topological term will look different. This is the uh, topological charge of the SO3 group. Uh, and they found that there is no such term in the theory for the triangular lattice at least. Um, so no luck with the topological terms uh, in, uh, in these attempts. Uh, and uh, this is where I will stop the, uh, the uh, review of the past and uh, we'll, we'll jump back to the future. And I'll tell you a little bit about the stuff that we've been doing uh, with uh, the field theory of non-collinear antiferromagnets where we did find some topological terms, although not exactly of, of that same type. Uh, this is the work done with uh, uh, my student, Bastian Prodenas, who is here. Uh, and uh, uh, interestingly, it was just published today. <laughs> Perfect timing. You know, thank you for putting my talk today. All right, so uh, it's a field theory formulated in a slightly different language from Doomer and Reed. Instead of the uh, rotation matrices, we chose to use uh, a triplet of uh, uh, vectors forming a frame, uh, which we call the spin frame. Uh, it's defined as follows. If you take the three uh, magnetizations uh, of a triangular or Kagami antiferromagnet, which have three sublattices, these vectors in the ground state form a coplanar structure with angles of 120 degrees with one another uh, with, the, with zero net magnetization. And so you can form uh, three linear combinations of these, one of which would be zero if you just add them up. That's the net magnetization. And you can also take a couple of differences between them. If you normalize them properly, you'll get uh, two orthogonal vectors, n, x, and n, y, uh, that will lie in the spin plane because they're made out of these. Uh, Wait, uh, are you on the lattice or you're on some long wavelength limit? Or? That's, that'll be the long wavelength limit. Okay, and so you're assuming m1, m2, n3 are coplanar. They're coplanar, yeah. So there will be small deviations from that. We include that net magnetization, but at the end of the day, we integrate it out as usual. Uh, and uh, there's a third vector that will be orthogonal to the first two and Z, which is the cross product of, of, of the first two or the cross product of any of these uh, vectors. And that's known as the uh, vector spin chirality introduced by Kawamura in the 1980s. Um, so these three vectors serve as uh, uh, an orthogonal reference frame. And uh, in fact, they're related to uh, the R matrix of uh, Doomer and Reed uh, in this way. Uh, these are the dot products between uh, the vectors of the spin frame and the vectors of some global frame, which is hanging out there somewhere and is the same uh, uh, at every point in space. So we can use them as orthogonal unit vectors uh, to expand any vector quantity in, in terms of them. Uh, and that's what makes it convenient uh, because it serves as a basis. Uh, you might wonder why exactly they're called an X and an Y. And that's because they're related to some spatial directions. So if you take uh, a triangle lattice or Kagami lattice science for a magnet, they have the D3 point group, which includes 120 degree rotations about the centers of triangles and the C2 rotations about axes coming through their centers like this one. So if you uh, ask what sort of uh, symmetries, symmetry transformations uh, we have, uh, we're gonna look at the transformations that change the positions of the spins without rotating them. Okay, so when I rotate, about this vertical axis, uh, these sites, the green spin will simply transfer here without changing its orientation and the red spin will, will, will go there. And so under these transformations, this particular one, M1 and M2 will be exchanged, M3 will remain itself. And you can figure out from this that NX and NY will transform in this way. NX will change the sign, but NY will not. That's the same way in which the components of a spatial vector change, like the gradient, for instance, partial X under the C2 rotation will flip the sign and partial Y will not. So that tells us what symmetry properties these uh, uh, staggered magnetization vectors or the spin frame vectors and X and Y have. And so they behave like the components of the gradient. And that will help us uh, uh, formulate the field theory of these uh, uh, vectors uh, vector fields. 
So for a ferromagnet, we know that the exchange energy basically is, uh, is the square of the gradient. Uh, and so we might uh, guess that for an antiferromagnet generally, such as this one, we're going to have to construct some quadratic form out of the gradients uh, of these spin frame vectors, uh, nx and ny, and there can be various combinations of these indices. There are four of them. We have to multiply it by some uh, uh, tensor of the fourth rank to get a scalar out of it. And if you promote D3 to a higher group like SO2 or something like that, or D infinity, then you can easily guess that the only invariant tensors would be the products of chronic or deltas. And so what you have to do is you have to take the tra various traces between these indices. So you can, uh, uh, for example, take the trace of over alpha and beta and gamma and delta or various other pairs. And that's basically the, the answer to what sort of uh, exchange terms you might have. So this is the most general uh, uh, exchange energy expression that, that you can have uh, uh, for a three sublattice antiferromagnets. So here we pair uh, the, the first two and the, uh, the last two indices or first and third, second and fourth, first and fourth, and second and third. So there are no other combinations. D3 might have more invariants, but at this level, it, they're, they're exactly the same. So this, in fact, uh, is reminiscent of other field theories that we know and love, such as the elastic energy of a hexagonal solid, which can be written in terms of the displacement fields or more precisely their gradients. And so if you want to make an analogy with these, then uh, here are the bulk modulus, the shear modulus, and what's called the rotation modulus, which for solids has to vanish because it doesn't cost anything to rotate a solid. But... Uh, and so that's why for a solid, we only have two uh, uh, elastic moduli uh, for this symmetry. But here we have three. So if you look at uh, various implementations of this field theory on the lattice, uh, if you use, for instance, the Kagame antiferromagnet with nearest neighbor exchange interactions, uh, then uh, you will only get uh, the lambda term, uh, but no mu and nu terms. Uh, and because uh, it has this uh, a special property. You can check that uh, partial X and X will cost energy, partial Y and Y will cost energy, but other combinations will not. And so that's that's the reason why um, you can say that uh, the Kagome antiferromagnet has what's called zero modes. Uh, it's similar to a solid without a shear modulus. So it only has a bulk modulus, uh, which is given by uh, sort of this term. Well, you can shear it without any uh, uh, increase in the energy, or in the magnetic terms, you can basically take, say, let's uh, the red and green spins, and you can rotate them about the blue spins. You'll maintain the 120 degree uh, 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 ground state condition, so that that move doesn't cost energy. Sorry. So here, uh, an x itself is a is a vector. An x is a vector. It's a spin vector. Vector, and n y is another vector. Right. Uh, are there any constraints between the two, or they are completely independent? So, in the ground state, they would be orthogonal. So they're not exactly independent. Uh, just like the field theory of the R matrices, these R matrices are not. You know, it's not like you have nine elements that are completely three by three that are completely independent, right? These have to be orthogonal matrices, so there are constraints. Similarly, here, n x and y and z have to be orthogonal and form a right triangle or triple rather. And so you, you can't vary them independently. They are uh, constrained to move together. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So uh, here are some experimental consequences that we can point out uh, uh, from this simple analysis. Uh, one of them uh, is that uh, the uh, exchange energy in the bulk of this crystal, in fact, depends uh, not on all three uh, elastic constants, lambda mu and nu, or the Lamé constants, but only on some combinations of them. If you look at the expression for the uh, speed of the spin waves uh, uh, for such a field theory, you can see that there are linear combinations lambda plus nu and mu that enter these expressions, and lambda minus nu does not. Uh, the reason for that is that, in fact, the first and third terms are related by partial integration. If you shift the derivative partial alpha from here to there and move this partial beta to here, you'll, you'll just get the, the first term. So by doing so, 
you basically, if, if you take the difference of these two terms with the same coefficients, this is going to be a boundary term, uh, which you can express as a curl of something. And so uh, an area integral of this is basically a line integral of that. Uh, and so it doesn't influence the bulk physics. That's an interesting observation. And therefore, uh, we don't have three separate constants in the bulk, but only two. And that's why the velocity satisfied constraint, which in this case is a Pythagorean relation. Uh, the, the squares of the first two velocities add up to the third one. And that you can experimentally verify it should work in any uh, 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 three sublattice antiferromagnet. Another verifiable consequence is that generally vortices on the system, uh, which uh, are known to be of the Z2 uh, topology, uh, should have an elliptical shape. Uh, and uh, this you can uh, uh, see if you observe that some terms uh, in the exchange energy, the mu term has a higher symmetry uh, because here you can see the coefficients of the, sorry, the indices of the gradient are paired uh, and the indices of the uh, sublet, uh, sorry, spin frame uh, uh, are also paired. So you can rotate separately the gradient components uh, or the uh, uh, sublattice indices. So this term has a higher symmetry SO2 cross SO2. Uh, and that's what happens in the triangular lattice. In fact, only this term exists. And it's because of an additional symmetry that exists in the triangular lattice. If you're interested in, that, in what that symmetry is, I can tell you. Uh, these other terms require rotation of both indices uh, or both the gradient indices and the uh, spin frame indices. So the symmetry is lower. Uh, and on Kagame, you have uh, just the blue parts, and on the triangle lattice, you have uh, just the red part. Uh, and if you examine the structure of vortices, in a theory with this higher symmetry, the vortices are basically uh, circular. They have a higher symmetry, but... The Z2 vortices now? These are the Z2 vortices, yeah. And... Uh, on Kagame, depending on the ratio of the coupling constants, you, you will get different degrees of electricity. Uh, Kagame with the first neighbor interactions only will be degenerate. Vortices will have an infinite ratio of the uh, major and minor uh, semi-axes. And that's again related to the uh, lack of stiffness in, in, in the system. So are you saying that the triangular has the same value for the three velocities so that you have a no it's there are two velocities that are equal yeah. and the third one is root square of two times that isn't that breaking the, the same? no 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 so you have two that that are sides and the third one is the hypotenuse mm -hmm. okay. so one one and root two that satisfies that i thought that if you had the, the isospin symmetry then the three velocities. no the isospin symmetry is not so3 it's so2 so it only relates two of those oh i see if uh, you can get all three degenerate uh, in a force of lattice antiferromagnet, if you can stabilize the state with 109 degrees between them somehow, then you will have three identical velocities. Yes. Yeah. yeah. All right. And uh, last but not least, there are topological terms uh, in this theory, uh, which I already uh, partly mentioned, I, I suppose. So you take this... Um, general expression for the exchange energy. Uh, and for the triangle lattice, uh, the sum of these two coefficients is zero. So we can cross them out, uh, at least as far as bulk physics goes. Uh, and then uh, we'll have just the mu term, the SO2 cross SO2 symmetric term participating in the bulk physics. So you, you'll get these uh, uh, speeds for the spin waves. But the edge physics will be uh, influenced by the uh, topological term, which is the difference of the lambda and mu terms. Uh, and if this term is allowed and it exists, it is allowed. And if it exists, then uh, you can transform this to a boundary term, or you can rewrite this as a Skirmian number of something. So this expression is the same as that one. And that's the Skirmian number of the vector spin chirality. So if your vector spin chirality is making some Skirmian pattern, then there'll be an addition to the uh, uh, energy of the system, which will be quantized. But don't you need a non-coupling spin for that? 
Uh, no, vector spin chirality is not scalar spin chirality. Okay. It's the cross product. So coplanar spins have the, the chirality pointing normal to the plane. Right, so uh, this term being a topological invariant will not change under infinitesimal variations, so it doesn't influence the equations of motion in the bulk, but it does change the situation of the edge because you can rewrite this as, a, as an integral along the boundary, and so this will influence the boundary conditions uh, for your spin waves. Uh, and it's an effect that was uh, found last year by Levitov and his uh, postdocs uh, in a model of, of a ferromagnet with orbital magnetization. Uh, the physics is quite uh, uh, similar between these two models. Um, and we came up uh, with a super exchange model, uh, which contains only Heisenberg interactions, no Dalshinsky moria but it does have uh, 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 chiral uh, spin wave edge modes. So the model is uh, uh, as follows. You have a triangular lattice, but the exchange is not direct exchange between the sides of the triangular lattice. It's mediated by some ligands that live in the middle of the triangles. Now let's assume these ligands have different abilities to mediate exchange, and the blue ones have a lower exchange uh, mediating ability. The red ones have a higher one. It doesn't matter in the bulk because every bond in the bulk has two uh, paths, the blue one and the red one, so they will add up to J, but at the edge, they will add up only to a fraction of J. And so you can see how this has an edge term. So if you analyze this model, then you can obtain the field theory that contains a bulk term like this and an edge term like that. And so the edge term produces uh, uh, a change in the boundary conditions uh, uh, that modify the boundary conditions for the rotation angles in the spin wave uh, as follows. And then you can show that there are uh, chiral edge modes bound to the edge. And uh, uh, here's the dispersion of these uh, chiral edge mode in addition to the bulk modes uh, uh, in that model with a particular value of this uh, disparity between uh, uh, the ligand uh, uh, exchange uh, strength. So you can see that uh, close to this uh, four, five, or three point uh, along the edge, uh, you only have uh, two modes instead of uh, four bound to the edge. And so uh, one mode travels in one direction and has a counterclockwise polarization, the other one clockwise polarization that travels in the other uh, direction. Um, so, one minute. Okay. Uh, an open question is about the magnum quantum numbers in this model. Uh, so if you take um, a collinear antiferromagnet, a ferromagnet, it breaks the SO3 rotational symmetry partially down to an SO2. You can still rotate about the direction of the uh, magnetization or staggered magnetization. And that's why you only have SZ uh, component of a magnum that you can specify. So SZ is minus one in a ferromagnet because you only can change the spin downward. And in an antiferromagnet, it could be plus or minus one. Um, for non-collinear antiferromagnets, the SO3 symmetry is completely broken. There is no axis about which you can rotate your spins uh, and uh, still retain that symmetry. So the ground state is completely asymmetric. Nonetheless, you can see that there is a degeneracy between magnon modes uh, in a triangular lattice antiferromagnet. It must be related to some kind of symmetry. And um, so Bastian uh, Perden has found a very nice answer to that. Uh, if you think about rigid body rotations, it's not just SO3. In fact, it's a uh, product of two SO3s, one of which is the rotations in the global frame, and the other is the group of rotations in the body frame, which commute with one another. Uh, and both of these rotation groups are completely broken by the magnetic order. Uh, but you can cook up a transformation using a global rotation and an equal and opposite uh, body rotation uh, that will leave the ground state invariant, but the excited states will transform non-trivially under these transformations. That's actually quite similar to uh, a situation in, in particle physics with uh, uh, pions, which uh, are sort of quasi um, uh, Goldstone modes uh, of the uh, uh, chiral SU2 cross SU2 symmetry 
and uh, triumphs have the isospin quantum numbers, which uh, are characterized by the combined or diagonal symmetry where you apply both SU2s with, with the same rotation angle. So that, that is something that, that uh, will be published uh, later on. So I'll leave you with my summary and, and uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs> Okay. So about this analogy that you made of elasticity, there one's a probably completely relevant comment, but in more rare lattices, actually, you do get the rotational term because now you have a preferred, right. just curious. But the second part, which may be, may be relevant, the, the, this, uh, the, this relationship between the spin waves, it reminded me a bit of compatibility relations in elasticity because you have three strains, but just two uh, lattice constant, sort of two directions to displace. So there's a there's an overall relationship between them. I wonder whether this makes any sense or... You, you mean the, the Pythagorean relation between the yes. velocities? Mm, I'm not sure I see it. Because there is also the squares, but that of the gradients, of course. And since they're in our gradients, I thought they could be seen. But anyway, we can talk more later. Yeah. yeah. So uh, this topological term you express in terms of this uh, spin spin frame. I mean, uh, you earlier you also mentioned uh, the previous work uh, describing everything in terms of the rotation yeah. matrix R. So uh, these are different topological terms. Uh, different topological so terms. So the Dumeray and Reed term uh, is a three form integrated over three space. Here we have a two form integrated over two space. It's so like only a all spatial coordinates, but not. Uh, no, but it's integrated over all three coordinates. X, so y, so y, the, the y, two form only has two spatial components, yes. So then can one understand this uh, new topological term also in terms of the R matrix? Uh, you can write it down in terms of the R matrix, but it's probably not going to be very insightful. <laughs> I'm just curious. Yeah. I mean, it must be some homotopy. Sorry, can I just yeah. I mean, uh, it must be some homotopy group uh, you know, mapping uh, from the... No, it's it's a different thing. It's It's a flux, basically. So you can vary the flux. Right. And if you think about the flux, it's, it, it, it comes from uh, quanta of fluxes. And when you rearrange things there, right? So your variations can only be changes in, small changes in positions of these individual flux quanta. So the total flux doesn't change. So you can think of it this way. Only if there's a boundary, once you, you know, some of these quanta cross the boundary, you'll have a variation. So that's exactly this term. Yeah, I think I know better. Okay, we can chat more later. Okay. I probably completely naive question. What's the, give us an example of three sublates and different magnets with three different uh, spin wave velocities? Kagame with further neighbor interactions. Kagame with third neighbor interactions. Yeah. Once you add third neighbor interactions, mm -hmm. one of the velocities become non zero. I think all three will be different. So, what happens to this chiral edge modes if you add some additional terms that say open the gap? Your gap at this point? Uh, a small gap will, will probably preserve these. Can I ask about the, the two SO3 rotation thing? So you said you can rotate the global frame or you can rotate the rigid body. Um, it seems to me that you can always do that, right? Isn't that the um the difference between like active versus passive transformation or something. So what's no, it's not uh, passive versus active. Uh, the, the, there is a good analog here. Uh, if you think about molecules, right? Molecule is a rigid body, and if you have a symmetric top, for instance, um, then you know its orientation is specified by three Euler angles, and uh, if you do a Fourier transform it means that you have to use uh, three quantum numbers, the length of angular momentum, and two of its projections. One of the projections onto a, is onto a global axis. It's called M. So L and M, we're familiar with that. But then, then there's, there's a third conserved number, which is mu, that's projection onto one of the local axes, the symmetry axis of the molecule. So molecules are characterized by three quantum numbers, their rotational states. and uh, it was a, a revelation to me when I first encountered that back in, in, in grad school, that there are two components of angular momentum that commute. That's impossible, but it's because one of them is a local 
or body frame component, and the other is a global frame component. And these components always can move because all these rotations can move. Other questions? Yeah, quick question related to Liang's question. So, isn't that topological invariant that you're writing is simply the degree of phi two of S two? You are using only n three. It lives on the surface of the sphere. So it's um, the sphere into the sphere. Right? <laughs> I'm not a mathemat I'm mathematician. I just really want to see you just give your number for the entry field. Um I'll need to think about it. Uh, I can't answer that question on my feet. Okay. So this is like quite honestly. Thank you. Yeah.